call the September 28th regular board meeting to order. If everyone would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Where's the flag? Oh, okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Need a motion to approve the agenda. Any discussion, questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All finds us all present. Item five. Item five, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of August 24th, the special session minutes of August 31st, and the closed session minutes of September 14th. Second. Any questions or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Item six is community input. I'll read the community input guidelines and then we'll open it up for community input. We'll start with the uh, folks in the room and then we'll turn it over to the folks who are online. Welcome to this meeting of the Sheboygan Area School District Board of Education. We're pleased that you're interested in educational issues. We're interested in your comments and concerns about the school district. In order for the meeting to flow smoothly, please follow the guidelines these are the guidelines to be followed by anyone wishing to address the board this evening. Please limit comments or suggestions to three minutes or less because we do have a full agenda to follow. Comments and suggestions on the school district are welcome. Personal criticism and or derogatory remarks directed at members of the board or employees of the district will be called out of order. Uh, I believe we have two podiums. David, they're saying they can't hear you. Okay. How about how's now? Can you hear me now? Can you? A little more volume, Jordan. Yep. A little more volume, please. Yep. I was afraid that was going to happen. All right, I'll try to yell louder. Uh, if you wish to provide input and would be like to recognize, be like to be recognized, please come forward to uh, the podium. There'll be a clipboard there where you can uh, write down your name and address for the record uh, before you get started with your comments. Please state and spell your name if needed and share your address for the record. The board normally receives citizen input and does not respond or debate. If there's a need for an answer or a response to a concern or issue, the superintendent or one of our administrative staff will get back to you. Thank you. So let's start with the folks in the room. Is there anyone here tonight who would like to give community input? Come up to the to one of the podiums, please. And your name and address for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Mary Lynn Donahue. I live at 418 St. Clair in Sheboygan. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to just share some thoughts. I did review the mitigation plan uh, put forward by the administration. Um, it is, the recommended action is in my view better than nothing, but it, it at least is a, is a path forward. One thing, you will need really adequate, thorough documentation. The plan does not work unless there's adequate information that comes to the administration to allow it to make decisions regarding masking, virtual schooling and so forth. And I just wanted to comment very briefly. Um, I was here for the committee of the whole meeting and what I saw I thought was pretty encouraging. Um, one of your members uh, said at some point during the deliberations, you know, this has been a pretty good meeting. And I think it was. A Couple of pieces on that. One, whether it's with respect to masks or whatever, the superintendent is the CEO of this organization and you are the board of directors. You have every right to ask for information and for policy suggestions. That is not something you need to worry about. That is your job. 
the administrator, uh, in turn, it, as I reviewed, as I was listening at the, the committee of the whole meeting, really pressed all of you hard to really clarify what it was that you wanted of him, and that's his job. And when you do those two things together, the administration moves forward, not only with this immensely complicated COVID issue, which is really one of the great challenges, I think, of the school district since the time that I have lived here and paid attention to it, but to anything. You have the right, you have the responsibility, the administrator has the right and has the responsibility. And when that goes back and forth, I think, as, as one of your members said, it, they, they will be good meetings. Meanwhile, be of good cheer, be strong, be brave. These are hard times. They're, for a, just a wide variety of reasons, you are serving the public. You are, <laughs> you are in the, the literal hot seat. And I know that no matter what our thoughts are back and forth, we all thank you for your energy, your intelligence, and your courage, because that's what it takes. And, and so I thank you and stay strong. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify too, I was gonna say this earlier, I just wanted to clarify that the item um, regarding COVID and the mitigation efforts is the first item on the agenda. We do have a really lengthy agenda tonight. I'm gathering that most of you are not gonna stay for the whole meeting. So we front loaded it with the item that was of the most interest to you. And it is listed for information and discussion. So there won't be any motions by board members and there won't be any action taken by the board tonight. And I just wanted to make that clear to everyone so that we're on the same page. So uh, anyone else in the room who would care to address the board? And we've got the other podium there that you can use as well. You can use either one. Please state your name and record, your name and address for the record. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Education for Sheboygan. My name is Reverend Stephen Welch. I'm a resident of Sheboygan the uh, city of Sheboygan, and I'm a pastor of Reformation Presbyterian Church in the town of Wilson. Wilson. I um, come here this evening not to address the issue of um, the uh, COVID, but to address a different issue altogether that has created a lot of concern across this nation, and particularly in our schools, and that is the concern of the critical race theory curriculum. Uh, I understand that that's a curriculum that has been implemented in the Sheboygan School District, uh, but it's being adopted in schools all across the country. The issue with the critical race theory is it's created a lot of confusion and a lot of dissension within our culture. Uh, the critical race theory, or what is known as CRT, is being promoted across our nation as a solution to the issue of racism and has been popularized by a number of groups like Black Lives Matter. Its major ideology is that racism is inherent in all of our laws, institutions, and every fabric of society, and that it creates social, economic, and political inequalities between rights, between whites who are often seen as the oppressors and blacks who are seen as the oppressed. One particular um, critical race theory writer, Ibram Kendi, who's the author of a book entitled How to Be Anti-Racist, says that the only remedy to racial discrimination is discrimination against those who are of the oppressing race. And this by and large is racism. The issue in our culture is that we have um, made this whole issue of race as a thing that divides people. Racism by definition and historically has always been to make one race superior um, to other races. And that is racism. We can call it whatever we want, but when we promote one race above another race or one race is superior to another, that's racism. And I think most of us in this room and at least those that I know, and I know a number of people that I've involved with, who would deny racism in any form. Um, there's no one in this culture that wants to see um, 
that sort of thing promoted. But when you look at the agenda of the whole uh, critical race theory and you see it in the um, curriculum that's being promoted is that our culture is racist and everybody's racist. I think that's, that's not even a, a fair, accurate thing to say because not everybody's racist. Not everybody is opposed is to one particular race. So I would encourage you as a board to uh, look at this further and uh, to think about this issue. And I appreciate the time you've allowed me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who would care to address the board? Yep, come on up to either one of the podiums. Hi, my name is Laura Donnelly. Um, my address is 4517 Pheasant Lane in Sheboygan. Um, I have the unique opportunity to address you tonight as a parent of four children, two of whom are um, students in the district. I have a middle schooler and I also have a kindergartner. And then I also work in the school district. So um, my day to day in the last three weeks has been greatly impacted by COVID and everything going on within our school. Um, so I just wanted to address you re regarding mitigation strategies moving forward. Um, I know there are multiple schools within the district that have gone virtual or within a classroom or two, um, and it's frustrating and it feels like we're failing our kids. Um, the COVID levels at our school are out of control in classrooms. We have more than one class that within the district that has gone virtual, and I'm wondering why we're not doing more to prevent this. Um, I know for my kids last year, I was fortunate. I had um, a little one who was out at Maywood, so he never went virtual. It was the best program we could have ever asked for, COVID or not. Um, but I did have a sixth grader last year who went virtual and struggled greatly, and I'm afraid that the same thing is, is going to be happening this year. Um, I know I'm not really interested in discussing face masks. I know that's been a hot topic issue, and the board has voted multiple times to not mask the kids. So let's move on from that and talk testing. Um, where I work, we've had symptomatic students from a classroom with known COVID positives allowed to return to school without first COVID testing. We've had symptomatic siblings of students who are in a room known to have a COVID outbreak allowed to return to class without testing. We've had students who have been sent home repeatedly for multiple COVID symptoms that have rendered them unable to learn that given day who have been returning to school day after day after day with no testing requirement, whose room has now had to go virtual. Um, I can say with 100% certainty that classrooms would not be closed had there been a testing related COVID mitigation strategy put in place by the school board. Um, it's frustrating to me because at this point I feel like we know better, uh, we need to do better, our kids deserve better, and they should be in school, they should not be forced to learn virtually because of lack of testing requirements within the district. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room here to address the board this evening? Oh, I'm sorry. Is this on? Yeah, okay. I got it. Yep, yep, I see you. Thank you. You ready? Yep, name okay, and address, my name, and then you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Lorraine Green. My address is 2308 North 35th Street in Sheboygan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. After the last meeting at South High School, I found out and informed all of you by email of the total funds that Sheboygan Area School District will receive from GEAR and ESSER funds, which totals, in case everybody else in the room hasn't heard, $21,606,049. This is ton, these are funds that are promised or already received. Uh, but there's a catch. You have to follow CDC guidelines, and that was stated in the uh, DPI documents that was, set, that was sent to all of you. So I know these funds are federal and state, and probably come out of all of our pockets. You are being influenced by money from us to follow guidelines that most of us are objecting to. This past Thursday, after reading the, uh, the Beacon, I found an interesting article that alerted me to the fact that there is an organization I was totally unaware of. It's called the Wisconsin Association of School Board. And 100% of the school districts in Wisconsin belong to that. Uh, this organization openly advocates for equity, which Reverend Welch addressed, and I wholeheartedly concur with him, uh, masking and vaccinations. It relies on funding from dues. 
Well, I'd like to know who's paying those dues. I can certainly guess it's probably us. It's coming out of our pockets. So again, we are uh, paying for something and uh, promoting something that we stand before you objecting to. This, by the way, this, <laughs> this website is not very uh, forthcoming. You, I cannot access the newsletters that you receive. I cannot access a lot of information. So the transparency there is, is turned off. I did find out there's a Donovan group connected to the Wisconsin Association for School Boards and legal advice is given. Again, all of this money, all this power, uh, this minute, through money that is advocating for the very things that we concerned citizens and par parents are totally against. We also know that the NEA, the DPI, the CDC, the health department, medical groups and hospitals, the county board of supervisors, and their various affiliations, among other, many others, have all the same interconnections and goals. I see I have only about 30 seconds left, so I'm gonna to have to paraphrase the end. Um, so you're going to listen to, it comes down to the point, are you gonna to listen to all these organizations where we're funding it through our pockets to encourage you to do things that are unhealthy, unconstitutional? Or are you going to stand up for the kids? As P.T. Barnum said, no one ever made a difference by being like everybody else. Thank you. Yeah. And anybody who doesn't get all their comments done, if you've got them written out, you can email us the whole thing too. And we'll look over them. Yes, next. Carol, De Carol DeSalt, 2736 North 30th Street, Sheboygan. Thank you. Uh, I have taught for almost 40 years. I'm retired now. Most of those years were in Sheboygan Area School District, and most of those years were with working with elementary kids. I think we all can agree on a few things. The first one is we're all here because our children are our most precious treasure in society. Our biggest job is to keep them safe. Keeping them safe at school has to be the priority of this board. I hope that you will take that, that seriously. Children are really very flexible and very adaptable. I've always been amazed at how they can bounce back, how they can adjust and how they can adapt. They're so much better at that, that than adults are. And they will take our cues from us as adults. If we ask them to wear a mask, most of the time, the kids will readily agree to that unless they see the adults around them fussing about it. COVID won't harm all of our kids, but who among us wants to take a chance that it will harm any of our kids? Please don't allow yourselves to be influenced by the loudest or harshest voices or the angriest voices. Think about what we need to do to keep our kids safe. Please institute a mask mandate. I can guarantee you that the kids will adjust much better than the staff and the adults around them. And please heed the warnings of the teacher who is just at this podium about testing and tracing. Let's just do that first job so that teachers and kids can get back to in-person schooling and stay there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Uh, John Paul, 5332 Wild Meadow Drive in Sheboygan. Thank you. Uh, so one thing I just wanna remind all of the board members is that yes, you are public officials. You are paid by us. And uh, ultimately at the end of the day, we decide everybody's fate if you're a public official. Uh, and I just want everybody to remember that. Uh, majority rules, and that's usually the way it is in our republic, and it'll hopefully stay that way. Uh, second of all, I think one thing that gets missed at some of these meetings is a lot of people say institute XYZ, get rid of XYZ, uh, but nobody tends to give information on, okay, I think you have a decent policy, but here's what I I'd like to see it. So this is speaking for me personally, the agenda that was put on for tonight to be talked about, uh, 
I, I think it's a decent agenda. It's a good starting point. However, the one thing that I don't like is uh, that it looks to me that we are discriminating against younger kids because, quote unquote, they can't get the vaccine. Uh, and that's why the percentage that's allowed is 2% as opposed to 4% for others. So for those that are on the board that haven't thought of it this way, for every 100 kids, that's only two people. So if you got a hundred kids in an area, if two people get COVID, you're going to a mask mandate. That's a pretty small amount considering the city of Milwaukee considers themselves in a very serious stage. And you have to look at the percentages, not the words that are used by the CDC and other health officials. You can call it whatever you want, but it's two kids out of a hundred that you're going to put a mask on. And for me, that's a little low. Um, you know, Unfortunately, the mask thing has become political. Anybody that says any different is living under a rock, uh, in my opinion. And can something be done so the board can move on? Sure. I think this is a good starting point. But for me, two kids out of 100 is, I mean, that's awfully low. And especially to discriminate against them for not getting the vaccine. Um, I, I'm not particular of, and we give no credit to the people that have had COVID either. If you've had COVID, you're discarded as someone who has never had it, doesn't know what it's like. Your body's never built up an immunity and you're going to go out and kill all these people. And these kids are going to go out and kill all these people. I think that's irresponsible and wrong. Uh, so when you're, when you're talking about this tonight and you consider maybe changes to it, just think two kids out of a hundred, that's uh, that's the number you need to be focused on. Not 2%. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Allison Warren, 4321 Morning View Court, Sheboygan. I'm a parent of a local elementary school. Science is not political. Science does not care about policy. Science will be what science will be. And I say this as a scientist. It doesn't change because we find it inconvenient and the virus doesn't go away because we are tired of it. Most of us in this room are not experts on epidemiology, disease transmission, or public health, so I will defer to the people who unquestionably are. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Centers for Disease Control have all said that masks are necessary in schools regardless of vaccination status. A CDC study out of Arizona has found that county without school mask mandates are 3.5 times more likely to have COVID outbreaks than counties with mask mandates. The Sheboygan County Division of Public Health has recommended masks and the county has mandated masks in their buildings. We cannot pretend that we don't know. As of last week, there have been 89 cases of COVID in our local schools. We cannot pretend that we don't know. The Americans with Disabilities Act guarantees every child a free and public education in the least restricted environment. This means that ADA and IDEA federally mandate us to make in-person education as safe as possible for every child, including diabetic kids, including immunocompromised kids, including kids with congenital heart defects, every child. This is an accessibility issue and when we say but they had pre-existing conditions. What we really mean is, but they don't matter. They do, every child. My grandfather had an autoimmune disorder. His immune system was completely gone. He ultimately died of septicemia from a common sinus infection that I almost certainly gave him. I was 13 and I can tell you that I most certainly blamed myself. We can talk all we want about how kids get mild COVID, over 500 kids dead, says that isn't always true, and we don't know yet what the long-term effect will be, but we can talk about it. But I can promise you that if a young child recovers from COVID, but their parent or grandparent does not, they will absolutely blame themselves, and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. We owe it to our kids to keep them safe, we owe it to our kids to keep their families safe, and we owe it to our kids to keep their community safe. That is our responsibility as adults, and rights without responsibility are meaningless. Thank you. Next. Go ahead. Hello. 
I am Randy Livermore at 527 North 25th Street. And I keep hearing about the science behind the mask. Yeah, sorry. I keep hearing about the science behind the mask. But just this past uh, summer, we lifted our mask mandate and our numbers dropped so low, you were more likely to die in a car accident. Then the vaccine was released and all suddenly our numbers are going up. What's going on with the history? Why are we not paying attention to this? Why is it all about the science? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room who would care to adjust the board? Yep. Come on up. Ruth Villarreal, 1406 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, I just want to point out, I think many in our community already know that I have a pending lawsuit against the county for being fired last year. And I'm gonna to present to you the same thing that I presented to my attorney. And God willing, each and every person that's here and listening to the live feed will have the opportunity to follow my case. The virus that is being spoken about that you guys want to test our children on has never been isolated in and of itself. How are we testing for this virus? How are we vaccinating for this virus? Until this school board is able to present the parents with this information, we are going to kindly not accept anything. It does not exist then. There is something going on and you guys need to ask those questions too, just as I have. I put my foot in the door. I took out my retirement to fund my litigation and there's many parents that will be ready and prepared to do the same thing based on that one question. How are we testing? How are we implementing these things if it has not been isolated in and of itself. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. My name is Jessica Schlafke, 1116 Los Angeles Avenue, Sheboygan, Northside. I guess I have a question. I wanna know what percentage or what numbers you guys have that you're gonna help base your decision on the mask or not. I'm here for that reason only. I'm not for the mask. I don't want my kids wearing masks. And the second thing that I wanted to say is that the last meeting we had, it pretty much summed it up for me. A gentleman stood up and said um, he couldn't, nobody could hear him. He had a mask on. And I believe the gentleman in the middle up there had said, it is his choice to wear a mask. That's it. It's a choice. We are parents and we have that choice. And that is, I, I worked the entire PGA, 40,000 people a day, no one's masked. And now masking in schools, it's ridiculous. It's gotta stop, no more masks. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, my name is Maeve Quinn. I live at 310 St. Clair Avenue. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. The COVID plan shared in July was based on the community COVID levels that were quite low. It was a decent plan for when our community was at a low yellow COVID level, level instead of a high level or red. At the time, we were all relieved and thankful that the focus and goal was to have in-person instruction five days a week. Students, teachers, and families all want in-person instruction. Unfortunately, at the start of the school year, our community had a high red positivity rate of COVID and our numbers have continued to climb. As someone already shared, since school started, we've had 89 students testing positive and we've had 17 teachers who have tested positive. This updated plan tonight uh, attempts to address the concerns of what the school district should do when there is a COVID spike in individual schools. The overriding goal is to support the district-wide efforts to continue to safely provide in-person instruction five days a week. I am thankful that this updated plan now has included more mitigation strategies that the superintendent can employ if there is a COVID spike in the school. These strategies are preferred to only having the option of virtual school. 
At the school board meeting two weeks ago, it was a bit alarming for me to listen to the superintendent share that he did not feel he had the authority to require face masks if there was indeed a spike of COVID cases at an individual school. This was due to the variety of motions taken by the board since May. It is my hope that your discussion tonight can provide more clarity for our superintendent so that he is fully aware that he can utilize the mitigation strategy of wearing the face mask when there is a COVID spike in a classroom or school. The scientific studies strongly support the efficacy of mask wearing and during this period of high positivity rate, our county and city buildings are now requiring face masks. Even the Ryder Cup required face masks in their buildings. It makes sense to me that the school district should follow their, their example and require face masks when there's a high positivity rate in our community and or building. And then finally, I really applaud the addition of the free COVID test at staff kiosks at each school. Having these free tests available for students, their families and teachers will really help our schools to contain the spread of this deadly virus. This was part of the plan shared two weeks ago, but I wasn't really able to locate the strategy in tonight's plan that was attached. I am hopeful they're still included in the district plan. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Hello, uh, Bill Moss, 1329 North 47th Street, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. COVID mania, 561 days into slowing the spread. This time we question everything. First, congratulations to administration for creating the daily COVID dashboard. It's very useful. I've been looking at it every day, Seth. Uh, I disagree on a comment tonight that a school board exists to uh, ensure student safety. I believe a school board exists to ensure a quality education. As an example, do our school buses have seat belts? They didn't in my day. I don't think they do now. Administration is directed will make recommendations for triggers to enact mandatory masking. For those unfamiliar with percentages, 2% is 1 in 50 students, 4% is 1 in 25. Figures that hardly resemble an outbreak. Those levels are way too low in my opinion. Remember, the 2% remain home, while the 98% will be required to wear masks for at least 14 days. Why 14 days? I repeat, why 14 days? It is almost as if we recognize that the ragtag mix of mass types that have, have zero effect. Why doesn't a 100% COVID free building receive a 14 day mass free reward? Do we want our students happy and engaged in learning or frustrated and distracted behind a wet, dirty mask? Why do unvaccinated children need to protect vaccinated adults in this United States of America? As the My Mask Protects You and Your Mask Protects Me slogan now become My Vaccine Protects You and Your Vaccine Protects Me? How has Sweden managed to keep schools open this entire time while not mandating masks? Why has Sweden's neighbor Denmark removed all COVID restrictions? When will COVID mania finally end in the USA? Perhaps never. We better be prepared for that. A new Harris poll conducted this month surveyed 1,457 vaccinated people and 598 unvaccinated people. 58% of vaccinated people were concerned about getting a breakthrough case. 44% of unvaccinated people were concerned about contracting COVID-19. Finally, perhaps also in the never category, when will my Aurora doctors advise all their patients regarding what type of mask to wear, when to wear it, wear it and when to clean or dispose of it? This COVID mania will only end when we say it ends. The time is now until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Yep. Are you gonna, yep, come on up. Hang on, waiting a little longer. Eric Anderson, 1910 North 23rd Street. Um, before you start that, can you stop it real quick? Um, what's the plan if kids show up tomorrow? I, we can ask questions, right, real quick. Uh, what's the plan tomorrow? Can I ask a question before you start the? That's your public comment. Okay, what, I'm gonna, he's gonna have to, oh, so he's, okay. What are you guys gonna do or what's the plan for if kids come to school with no mask tomorrow? Is there a plan of enforcement? Are you gonna be 
beating up kids and throwing them onto the street nothing or what, what's the changing. plan? Nothing is changing. So law enforcement is going to stand with the constitution, right? And they're not going to be, you know, my brother's in law. I'm a, I'm a former veteran. So when we talk about the constitution, I lived it. I was overseas. I have friends that died over there fighting for this country. Um, so no kids will face any repercussions as far as I'm understanding. If there's they come to school tomorrow there's, without there's, a mask, is that, is that to be understood? There's nothing that's going to change tonight for tomorrow. Oh, you're not voting tonight. Correct. I, that's what I thought I made clear earlier. Okay. Okay. If I didn't, I'm sorry. There are no votes being taken tonight. Okay. Um, well then I guess I just get to say some stuff. Um, when people are talking about high positivity rate, they always say that 100 out of 100,000, drop the zeros. That's one in 1,000 people. That's considered a high transmission rate. For, so for the city of Sheboygan, you get, 50, you get 50 people before they start taking away your rights. 50 positive tests in Sheboygan before these people think they have the right to take away your rights. Now, the woman that came up earlier, basically what I kind of paraphrase is, we need to legally take away people's constitutional rights. We need to basically make sure we navigate that system correctly in order to take away people's rights. That's the way I heard it. Um, how do you get herd immunity from something that doesn't give yourself immunity, individual immunity? How do you get to herd immunity when you don't even get immunity yourself? Um, I don't wanna personally attack people, but I've never seen something so pitiful as a man wearing a mask because he's afraid of getting the flu. It's, 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 it's so, it's, if I was a woman, I, I, how, why would you go after a man like that? You think she's, you think I said, she, you think he's going to protect you from anything? I, you know, I, I mean, it's just a real question. I mean, I talked to kids out of school last week here and I asked them how many teachers are wearing masks. You know what the answer was? One, not one, you know, in this class, Aclus, one in all of North was wearing a mask, 10 to 20% of the kids. You've done a good job steering the kids. But why aren't the teachers wearing the mask? If they believe all this stuff, why aren't they wearing the mask? Um, this is a place of a public accommodation. You're all protected. You all have rights. No one up here, just like I can't take away your rights. Don't give them your rights. Don't, don't wear a mask tomorrow. No, nobody send your kid to school with a mask. They just said they're not going to do it. And if they vote on it, what, what, say you vote next week and, and you do vote for masks, what, what, what's the plan then for enforcement? Or two weeks from now, when you do vote, that is a that's a question. I, I, I can't speak to something that doesn't time exist is up. right now. And your time is up. Thank you. Anyone else would care to address the board? Yep. Come on up. Make sure I'm close enough here. Can You're you hear good. me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Missy Schonenberger, fifteen thirty-two. North Lane. And um, I just want to say we're not here to discuss if we're going to be in person or not. We're going to stay in person. I mean, that's we're, we're, we've already decided that we're going to be in person. Um, I, I want to say that I was at a volleyball game last week or the week before. I also went to um, a North High School football game. And I, I kind of want to thank Seth and the board um, I saw kids laughing, kids were cheering, they were smiling, they were playing in the band. You guys, it was awesome. It was awesome. Those kids were having the time of their lives. They're seniors in high school, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. It was wonderful. I was a little upset last week when I'm sorry, two weeks ago when a board member stated that she was visiting schools and she was upset that kids weren't social distancing. They, they were going to the cafeteria to eat together. And she was upset by that. Desks were facing each other. Come on, come on, really? It's just disappointing. These are kids that we're talking about. I used to teach in the district too. I taught a long time in the district. And I, if I were teaching now, I would not be wearing a mask with my kids. I'd be setting a good example. We're all gonna be okay. These kids need to laugh and smile and have fun and not be muzzled. 
So many people say, and I said this four weeks ago, a lot of people will say, it's not a big deal for kids to wear masks. Oh, they're resilient. They can wear masks. It is a big deal to them. How many of you have to wear the masks for eight hours a day and can take it off just to eat for a few minutes at lunch and you're policed at school? And then you have to stay after school to play a sport. Well, you don't have to, but this is what these kids do. It's it's what they do in high school. They have activities. They're in plays. They're in masks eight to 14 hours a day. None of you are. None of you are. You're at home sitting in your with your mask off at home. Or if you are out in public with your mask on, it's not eight to 14 hours a day. Please let these kids laugh and smile and have fun. Homecoming week this week for North and South. Well, for North. Um, let them have fun and be kids. They're okay. We're at 0.37% in our district. I think that's great. I think we're doing great. Please let them keep up having fun and smiling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hello. My name is Stephanie O'Connell. I um, live at 704 Highland Terrace. I have four children, two of them in the Sheboygan Area School District. Um, I would like masks to remain optional. Um, nobody is trying to take away anybody's right to wear a mask. I truly believe that the kids will not be bullied if they do wear a mask. Um, if you wear Crocs, you might get bullied though. You can tell the kids that we can address that at a different board meeting. Um, so people keep saying there are so many positive cases within the school district, 89 positive cases. What is the metrics for cases versus hospitalizations? How are the, how many of these cases are ending up in the hospital? We do have a vaccine available for this virus and the fatality rate has dropped significantly. And if you're gonna talk about the fatality rate, let's talk about kids, 25 and under, it's like a one in a million chance that you're going to die. Just over 400 children have died of COVID. And I'm not gonna say, oh, because they had pre-existing conditions, because yes, they all matter, okay? But that's a very low number. Currently, the flu is more dangerous to children than coronavirus. And we have never done this for the flu. And imagine if we had, I mean, we can't, we can't continue living like this forever. It's ridiculous. And I would see this coming to a point where, you know, this next month, they're going to be approving the vaccine for children five to 12. Are we going to have to be attending these meetings because you're going to try to vaccinate our children so that they can come to your school? You know, because the vaccine hasn't, you know, eased any of these issues that we're dealing with apparently can drop the case fatality rate, but we're all still sitting here discussing whether or not we're going to put a stupid, ineffective piece of cloth over our kids' faces. It's ridiculous. There are no studies that show the efficacy of cloth mask wearing for viruses. They do not work. Even paper and surgical masks, they're not used properly. So they don't work. Please keep choice in our schools for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep, are you coming up? Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Martha Barr. I live at 2122 South 7th Street in Sheboygan. I wanna thank you all for your hard work. And as others have said, the difficult task that you have in front of you tonight, and not just tonight, but any other times, I'm sure. Um, as far as the masks go, I am married to the nurse at St. Nick's who does the mask testing 
and mask fitting for the employees at St. Nicholas Hospital. That is the N95 mask. Now, the N95 mask is only 95% effective. And that is a mask that is used in hospitals as is okayed, you know, or, you know, whatever um, is, you know, what they use and is only 95% effective. So when you look at a cloth mask, as opposed to an N95 mask, what are you really doing? Nothing, nothing. Um, I think that masks should be, man, should be um, optional. Anybody who feels that they are safer, um, if that makes them feel better, that they should have that choice. But all of us should have a choice, whether we want to wear one or not. Um, also, I want to remind you um, that all of the statistics and all the numbers and the percentages that people bring up are not necessarily accurate. Um, I don't think that we can have trust and belief in our government and what they're telling us. I think that we need to use common sense and look at everything from all angles before we make a decision on something. This has been be, become an incredibly political polarized situation. And I'm so sorry that all of you have to be put in the middle of all of this. Um, but I hope that you come to a decision that, you know, everyone can, you know, be happy with. And I have a feeling that that would be masks are optional. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Gotcha. Afternoon. I'm Blake Bennett. Can you get closer to the mic, please? My name is Blake Bennett, Thank 1205 you. Mead Avenue, Sheboygan. Uh, I've been to a couple of these school board meetings and all we hear is mask, mask. I want to hear education. My kid is so far behind that it's, it's, it's just sickens me. How am I supposed to send my child to school and he's not getting educated? All we talk about is that stupid mask. Get over it, period. And if you guys are going to bring a mask mandate back in, who's going to police the police? Seth, he knows I've called him numerous times, showed him pictures, showed him pictures of staff not wearing their mask, but it's mandated. But yet my child gets in trouble. My child gets bullied by the people that are on this board and the people that are in those schools bullying my child and there goes his education, right down the flipping tubes. So keep that in mind. Education, remember, that's what you guys are here for, education. I have yet to hear how we're gonna get these kids back up to par. Because right now we're, we're well below that, well below it. I see it every day. And it absolutely sickens me that you guys are doing nothing about it except bickering about these stupid masks and what you believe in. We personally don't care what you believe in. Because it's not up to you, it's up to us. You guys are all elected up there by us. So it's about time you listen to us and let's get the education going. And stop this little bickering back and forth like a bunch of little kids in a, in a damn sandbox. I'm done with it. I want to see education. I want to see my kid continuing his education. I'm sitting down doing his math for him. I'm like, geez, come on, bud. This is easy. No, because he hasn't been taught it yet because everybody's too bickering about the stupid mass. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. This can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Alley. Um, my address is 4627 West Strand King Drive in Sheboygan. I have two students in the district. Um, I was just looking at the the slide number five. I know you guys probably don't have it in front of you. Um, 
from the, the, of the COVID presentation, um, kind of taking it back to what someone else brought up about the two and 4% for the younger kids. I don't know if we don't go with Ruth's idea, which I like, I think is great being presented with an isolated virus, then we can solve all the problems. That'd be wonderful. Um, but until then, I'm thinking maybe to come to a compromise, which would appease everybody, um, setting that percentage higher so we don't, so everybody can be, it would be a good compromise, I feel like. You know, like, I don't know, way more than 4%, though. I don't know, 25, 30, 50, 75, I don't know. A higher percentage to look at, I think, would be a little more uh, round, well rounded, I guess. And I would say per class, not, you know, I think it would be better like per class, keep it per class. Um, so we can get back to our focus of cleansing and cleaning up our curriculum, which needs very much attention. Um, and I would like to kind of circle back to um, the testing, which is actually still under emergency use authorization, which actually hasn't even been proven to, it shouldn't even be used for what they're using it for. So I just think this virus isn't going anywhere and we cannot do this forever. This needs to come to a halt and we need to refocus on educating our students and keeping them smart. I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Thanks for your time. You bet. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then I'm gonna switch over to, are there some folks online stuff? Those, those people that uh, wish to speak online will have to raise their hand and I will unmute them so that they can speak okay. and address the board if, one at yeah, a time. If you're online, um, just use the raise hand feature and then Seth will unmute you and we'll let you address the board. Anyone online? Okay. Don't have anyone online. We will move on. Uh, item seven, superintendent's report. So. Yeah, good evening again, everyone. Thank you, audience members for being here as well. The, um, uh, obviously at this time in September, we've spent a lot of time uh, getting school underway. And so as I report out tonight, just uh, you know, excited to see, as some mentioned, uh, in their public comment, uh, kids engaged in a variety of activities, the clubs, the after school um, activities, uh, sports and, and the like, uh, but also engaged uh, in it, more importantly, are focused on the classroom and engaged in lessons, engaged in activities. Uh, we've had an opportunity as an executive management team and our central office staff to be able to be out in our classrooms, in our buildings, supporting um, our teachers, supporting our students and uh, I've seen wonderful things uh, going on in those classrooms. So uh, very pleased uh, with the start of the year, especially for some of our students who were not in school, who were not in school last year uh, as they were elected the virtual only option uh, for them to be in a building uh, in, in face to face in a classroom. So very excited about that. Uh, September 14th, we broke ground at, uh, for the North and South uh, construction, uh, house construction, the groundbreaking took place, like I said, on the 14th. Uh, we are building a house, the, it's actually the second house now that the uh, foundation actually was poured today. Um, lot 78 in the Stonebrook Crossing uh, on the south side of Sheboygan. Um, this, was, this will be the 24th house to be constructed uh, with our house construction, the sixth one being built under the direction of Ted Schurmetzler, the teacher. So very excited about that. And as you uh, drive past the Stonebrook Crossing and see the house is starting to go up and the SASD house um, would be very impressive. Look forward to the opening um, 
open house uh, around time of graduation. So very excited ab about that. In terms of some internal um, and external relationships, uh, you're gonna hear a little bit when we talk about our long range plan, uh, really uh, trying to, to increase the amount of, of posts on our social media and be able to get uh, positive messages out to celebrate. One of the things that uh, we've done over the past several years and did it again this year was to uh, feature our school, new school leaders uh, who are new to the SASD and feature them across the district in multiple posts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, the remaining of the posts that uh, uh, were done will be done um, this week. Uh, one of the posts uh, recently, we welcomed uh, True Vang as our elementary principal at Jefferson. Uh, True's uh, post uh, achieved the highest reach of any non-COVID related post we've done with 25,000 reaches and more than 1,600 comments, likes, and shares. So uh, just again, they've been well received and a good way to get to know some of our administrators across the district. So uh, with that, I'll take any other questions you might have. Questions? For Seth. Okay, move on to <clears throat> miscellaneous item A. This is the update on the district's COVID mitigation and response, Seth and team. Just want to make sure there. I'll move it up just a little bit. See if that helps. Um, what I have before you in, in your packet, I'll briefly go through the, the introductory slides. That's just an update again on where our current metrics are across the district. So again, I'll provide an update tonight on the metrics, uh, both internally and across the community, just for that perspective piece. Um, talk about some additional mitigation and response measures that have been implemented and, and uh, talk through um, where we're at in terms of those cases or absences uh, when they're at a consistent high level within a classroom or building, and then share the recommendations that you've asked as a board uh, for the administration to come back with tonight around uh, facial coverings and when would they shift uh, if um, levels were high at an individual school uh, versus a district-wide approach. So in terms of some current uh, Data on slide four will really walk through the cases in the Sheboygan County. Um, that was in this last week, um, the seven days when we publicized this, there was 279 per 100,000, which equates to um, uh, today's numbers uh, would be 271 cases um, or 286 per 100,000. Uh, when we look at cases in the Sheboygan Area School District, Again, there's about 60,000 residents that live or reside in the Sheboygan Area School District boundary. Uh, with that, uh, that would make about 240. Uh, today's numbers were about 210, so slightly down. That was 127 cases out of those 271. 127 out of 271 were here in the Sheboygan Area School District boundary. Testing positivity rate, although it was over 10%, has now decreased to 9.4 in the last day or two. Um, slide five is one you've seen multiple times. That's just the CDC's uh, guidance. Slides number six and seven, just kind of uh, talk about the seven day average. The first one, how many new cases per, per uh, over the seven days. So new case average each day over the seven days. So there's 44 is what we were averaging on 922. That was 38 as of this morning. In terms of the boundary, we were at 21.29 on 9.23 and 18.14 on as of today, the 28th. Slide eight again goes through just case rates. Um, this was uh, from the 21st of September. That's the latest data the county provides. Um, so I don't have any updated data that would be coming out uh, typically on a Wednesday afternoon and sometimes Thursday morning to get the, the updated. So I, these are from the 21st again, as you can see, in the footnote. Vaccination report, again, just broken down by county residents. You can see the age breakdowns um, that are there as well. Slide 10 uh, talks about vaccination, vaccination rates by age group in the county. Again, these are the data as of September 21st. 
Slide 11 talks about comparatives, uh, looking at a comparison, excuse me, between districts that are with vaccination status by district boundary. Uh, that information is there at 56.6% in the Sheboygan Area School District boundary, um, uh, compared to some of the other districts at 40 or as high as 65 um, in some of the other districts. Slide 12 uh, indicated where our current cases are. And uh, you can see it was 89 and 17 when we reported out, uh, made this available on Thursday. Uh, today, that number is 117. Staff number is 23. So we have seen an uptick in staff and student uh, cases. Um, that was up from what we reported, 67 additional cases in the last two weeks of students and 12 of staff members. Again, those uh, breakdown, what we're seeing is a split really between elementary of the student side. Um, in looking at that cumulative data, 45 of those cases were at the elementary level, 46 were at the high school, 19 at the middle school, and our 4K, 3K population was seven. Uh, at, in terms of staff, um, elementary wise, 12 staff who work in elementary buildings, two at the middle school, six at the high school, and two at our 4K level. COVID dashboard is on slide 13. Slide 13, uh, again, just shows a, a, a snapshot of the dashboard. The link is there in the presentation. It goes live to our page. Um, the cases that are there, we have that daily running total of students. Again, just for clarity, we've got some questions and I just wanna make sure everybody's clear. Those cases are on as active cases, meaning they've incurred within, uh, if a case was positive today, that information is coming from the state WED system. Uh, those people that have received a positive test or have received a positive home test and have worked with the county health on that. So those are the, the two ways that those get put into that system. Both of those numbers are sources is what's being used to drive the dashboard. It's the cases stay active for 14 days. That's the common definition that groups are using in terms of active status. So that's, they're on there for 14. Some are saying, well, I know that maybe we had one or two new cases at our school, but the number's the same. Well, each day that's updated, there may be cases dropping off as new cases are coming on. So not necessarily that you're gonna see this constant, or again, it's not a cumulative, We're really talking about an average. There is a, a, a link you can look at in terms of cumulative numbers on that dashboard as well. Um, today, uh, uh, which is different from what you see in your packet, 29 active student cases, seven active staff cases for a total of 37, total active cases, I'm sorry, 36. Um, we do have uh, students at, at a variety of schools. You can see that that are active and their percents are there. One of the questions that we've also fielded, which relates to the COVID dashboard is the notion of the county health department and what they list as facility-wide investigations. The county health department has listed 14 different schools of the Sheboygan Area School District that are on their list of what's called facility-wide investigations. Those investigations are, are uh, classified, I should say, or schools are classified as having an open investigation. If there's been two or more cases reported in a, a school, that is regardless, however, if it has a direct link to our school, it could be a, a case where a parent who have tested positive and maybe the child tested positive, they may not have been in school, but it still gets linked to our school because they are asked, what school do you attend? So those cases stay on there um, and an open facility-wide investigation remains in effect for a minimum of 28 days and that there's been no new cases within those 28 days reported. This is nothing new. This was done last year in terms of uh, communication with the public of where there's been cases in schools. Uh, quite honestly, we had every school listed at one point or the other last year because we had cases in all of our schools within a 28 day period. Um, the 14 were not surprising. If you've been following the, the chart, uh, there are dashboard anytime that there's been two cases in active status that automatically would trigger that that would be placed in a facility wide investigation. What that really means is the county is monitoring our numbers 
Uh, if they see some higher numbers than the two, uh, they may reach out to us. They've done that a few times already this year to reach out and say, you know, what's going on? Are you aware of what's happening in the classroom or in the school? Is there any additional supports, et cetera? So it's, it's really a, a, a conversation. Um, the county could, however, as we've talked about before, those targeted directives, they could issue a targeted directive. But I just want to clarify that facility-wide investigation piece, because that is a question. Slide 14 then has that historical data. Slide uh, 15 uh, talks about that daily absentee reports. Both of the COVID dashboard and the absentee reports are updated every day prior to noon. Um, with the most up-to-date, the attendance would be updated from the previous day. The COVID cases would be those cases which we know of at that time of posting at noon. And that's updated the next day at noon. Um, as of today, um, our overall district absenteeism rate was 5.7%, up slightly over the, what was reported on the 22nd. That would have been yesterday's 927 data. We did have a few schools that were over the 10% that we've been monitoring. Um, two of those schools, both Cleveland and Jackson had higher rates. Those were schools that we've had transition a classroom to virtual instruction for 10 days due to high case levels or high absenteeism at those schools. Um, so we have made that uh, both of those schools um, decision um, that does impact as well then that absentee. So those are just the background again information. In terms of additional mitigation response measures, one of the things that you'd asked is in addition, what other things will, would we implement or have we implemented? And so uh, the listing there is things that we can certainly implement. Some we've already had to at schools, others uh, we're considering or may consider. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it really shows you the things to do in terms of enhanced social distancing, through limiting some group work, limiting some labs, some of those things, through cohorting if we needed to, looking at quarantining students, uh, increasing the length, shifting activities to virtual, we saw that there was an issue with a, with a club or an activity, um, staff meetings, those kinds of things. Um, we can also look at some reductions on, on buses and other things. So those are there. Certainly understand that people will disagree with some of these measures, may disagree with, with the face uh, covering recommendation and ultimately what the board decides. But I think, you know, as reasonable people, I think we can all agree. And I heard some people talk about that tonight as well. You know, what can we do to keep kids in school uh, and keep that in-person learning going? So obviously these are things taken when we've got a concern about what's going on from uh, absence. Uh, testing sites was, was asked and, and brought up. I mentioned that in my last presentation, where we're gonna have 19 different testing sites that would be optional for families that would like to have their children or themselves or a family member tested. Uh, our hope is to be able to open one this week. We're working with that vendor called COVID Clinic. Um, and uh, we hope to have the others online soon. I do not have firm dates on the others, uh, but we are continuing to work through that process as testing availability for those that are seeking it is hard to come by within our community based on the fact that there's limited, outside of a doctor's visit, there's limited locations to go to get tested for those that are seeking that. So again, that, that, that's there. In addition, we've increased communication surrounding uh, areas of concern, trying to, trying to make sure that our parents and staff are understanding that we're seeing some things occur in terms of an uptick in cases or absences at a building. So when we're seeing those two or more cases within a specific grade level, that we're sending out a communication to the families at that grade level, indicating that, talking about what symptoms they could be looking for, recommending if they'd like to seek testing, that there's a link to those. Again, as I mentioned, the sites are limited and our ability to offer some will certainly help that. Uh, we've also sent um, those same letters if there is a student instructed in a self-contained classroom, if there's one or, one or more cases within that 14 day period. Uh, we have a variety of, of classrooms to support um, some of our most medically fragile, some of our special education students where it's a small classroom. And that's why the difference between the two versus the one, 
typically those class sizes are, are 12 or fewer kids. Um, and then if we see the absenteeism rates at a building or within a classroom staying extremely high above, a, you know, relative obviously, but above the 10% when we usually hover well below that, and we start to see 10% or more, and we see that climbing over a number of days, we are sending a letter uh, indicating that we're seeing that. To some of the absences we've seen uh, have been related to stomach flu or stomach issues. We're seeing that trend go through some of our schools now. So we're, like we've done in the past, we're sending communications that we're seeing, there's a bug going around. We want parents to know what to look for, keep your kid home if they're not, but just be aware that there are, we're seeing an increase of illness within a particular classroom, grade level, or school, depending on the situation there. So um, we've sent letters out to a variety of schools. Uh, some additional ones went out today based on uh, the absentee rate and the case rates at school. Then starting on slide 20, uh, really talks about uh, what we've uh, made your point of why we're here tonight for this agenda item was to talk about a recommendation board uh, uh, asked on the 14th for the administration to come back and present a recommendation of when and at what point under what circumstances will be looked at recommending a shift to required facial coverings for a period of time within a specific building. Um, so with that, you ask for both metrics and a time frame. Uh, on slide 21 and 22, looks at a variety of options um, that we as an administrative team work through and had to narrow it down to a recommendation. Um, obviously, you had looked at wanting a recommendation around a specific time and location of when. So that really took option one, the universal uh, facial coverings for all students off the table, requiring facing, facial coverings for students, staff members, and looking at a 4K through six and maintaining optional higher at the higher grades. Um, option three we looked at was maintaining just our current and not coming forward with a recommendation. Slide 22 has three additional options. Number four was looking at a district-wide implementation at a predetermined level. Level five was looking at it when cases got um, 19 of uh, COVID-19 cases um, for a selected period of time. And that would again be for all students if the district as a whole numbers got there. And number six was requiring facial coverings um, when a building's active COVID-19 cases got to a predetermined level for a selected period of time um, and looking at other factors, in this case, one around vaccine availability. So uh, based on that discussion, based on that work, uh, settled on number six, which is to look at that building-based approach. So on slide 24, uh, in order to come to some um, determination of, of, of what's that predetermined level, looked at two factors. One, try to look at where is a percentage, if you will, um, of kids and at what level um, in terms of number of cases. And then also the fact that that method had a vaccine availability. Um, obviously, we try to put data in the next slides. We have some data in there and try to make this more of a database decision. But you know, with vaccinations uh, and differences with vaccinations, with other mitigation efforts, a number of students who selected a variety of, of options last year and limiting some uh, cohorting uh, two day a week face-to-face you know, -face versus two day or three day virtual like we did last year at the high school, it really makes comparisons from year to year more challenging. Um, it's more like apples and oranges, it's still fruit but it makes those comparisons more difficult. So I just want to throw that up front, that this is a, a little bit more challenging to, to, to get to a data point. Um, there is no magic number. And I think we've heard that uh, as our discussions all last year um, and throughout, that there's not a magic number. So it's really along that continuum, as I said before, between risk and reward. So where do people feel comfortable with that number um, based on upticks of situations? So 
what I what I did, and I just want to clarify slide 25, is we looked at the months of October and November from 2020. And the reason we looked at that data is that was the time in our district when we had the highest number of student cases throughout the year. It was October last year and November last year. Because I was looking at the number of times that we had at least a positive case, I, um, it's really meant there was at least one active case. So when you see that there's numbers there, the number of occurrences, it's not the number of days within that month. Obviously those numbers don't total up to the number of calendar days in that month. What I really looked at was each individual building by level and saying in the month of October at North High School, they had these dates where there was new cases. So on this date in October 1st, they had X number of cases that day which would then look at the past 14 days and include that October 1st date. Whatever that ratio was, or percent in this case, I should say, percent was at that building using their building population at the time, came up with a percent that ran somewhere between zero, well, it would have been above zero in that case, because they had at least one active case, to five plus percent. And so I just kind of banded those percents. So when you look at the high schools, when there were active cases, going on within, and I took every 14 day window because that's how we're looking at that now in a 14 day window. Um, so if there's a case on the 1st of October, um, that case and every case for the next 14 days got included when we got to the 15th day, that first case on October 1st would drop off. So that number would be adjusted. So you saw this numbers would go up or down each day depending on the number of new cases that day. When I looked at all of that information at the high schools, you saw that during that time, there were 24 different times in October and November when there were positive cases at the school where the positivity rate was below 0.99. And there were 41 times when the positivity rate of students was between one to 1.99%. There were 10 times at the two, six, four, one. So I did that at the high school level, did the same thing at the elementary level and the middle schools. So those numbers there are just the number of times during those period of time and the number of times that a, that a building had a positivity, at least one case that would give them a positivity calculation during those, during those eight weeks, if you will. So that helped kind of look at that 2%, 4% piece. When you look at vaccination availability, and obviously, you know, there is, and I, I just again will say it here and, and for everybody on, online and in the audience, the ability for a district in the state of Wisconsin to require vaccinations is not within a preview of any district. That is a legislative action only. So a district cannot require vaccinations. When we look at vaccination ability, the reason we looked at that as one of the factors to put in this, this discussion was the fact that we do know that there are people who are choosing to get vaccinated who feel that there's a lower risk than because they are vaccinated. Right now, our staff have the availability to get vaccinated. Children ages 12 to 21, which we have students in our district between those ages, have the availability if they choose to look at vaccination if they so choose. But students 11 and under, and we've heard from a number of parents over the past, since the summer and, and ongoing, we're saying, I, I'm waiting for that time. I feel it should be additional mitigation, but I'm waiting for that time and then we can reevaluate. So again, it's unavailable at this time. You might've heard in the news about this notion of boosters and booster shots. And obviously that, that's out there. Educators are included for our staff who had the Pfizer. That's the one that they're recommending a booster for or availability because we are classified as essential workers. So I just thought I'd throw that in there as well, but not for Moderna or Johnson & Johnson. So on page 27 then is the recommendation and looking at both factors of, of look, trying to come up with a, with a percent number, uh, that threshold, but also looking at that vaccine availability. There's really three things here. Number one would be looking at the 4K to sixth grade. And I'll, I'll, I'll address the split at the middle school a little bit. But at four to, 
4K to sixth grade, if we would reach 2% within a building, we would look at a 14 calendar day. So it doesn't mean 14 school days, but 14 calendar days. Um, minimum, and then look at if the percentage on day 15 drops is below 2%, then we're back to mask optional. We chose the sixth grade, sixth grade of the middle school, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth graders, although coming and going, they interact. There's not that interaction between other classes. Sixth graders at this point are not all 12, so they don't have yet the ability to vaccination if they so choose. So that was where that split came in. Looking at the seventh grade to 12th grade then, looked at a 4% measure, same thing, looking at calendar days, looking at when that building positivity would drop below after those 14 days, um, again, as an increased measure to try to reduce some of what's going on within that. Obviously, we had exemptions last year. We've maintained that same exemptions, uh, accommodations when physical, mental, developmental needs that are documented or are documented through the IT process or a medical provider. We had that going on all last year. Um, and many, uh, there were people that chose to, to look at that exemption. And so that exemption would, would still exist. Um, that would be the end then of my presentation. The last page is questions. So obviously I'll, I'll turn it back to you, David, for uh, your feedback, questions, discussion, et cetera. Brian? I don't know if my mic is on yet. It is, okay. Um, I don't, what happens on day 15? Say, um, you say an elementary school is at 3%. Would that restart that 14 day clock or, or is it a fort or would that, or would it be that, the, that you still would wear a mask until, that, until the positive rate drops below the, the 2%? look to do ryan would be to implement the 14 days we would keep that going then until that rate came down okay so so it would not so it wouldn't start all over again 14 wouldn't become 28 wouldn't become 42. other questions from board members So when there are positive cases in a classroom, whether it's the staff member or the student, are we currently doing, has there been contact tracing done by the health department? Are kids being quarantined or is that not currently being done? And, and if so, what would motivate that to happen? So the contact tracing is being done by the, by the county in terms of if there's somebody who is, um, as they work through that process, in that case, there are kids in quarantine. We do have uh, kids in quarantine currently. Do you know how many we have? Currently? Yeah, okay, if I can just, I've got a note here in one of my slides. We have 400 and, um, we have 413 kids that are out on illness. We have 140 that are officially in quarantine so we're not we're not quarantining very many compared to how many kids are are ill that's correct and is that different than last year is that the same that's different from what we were doing last year in terms of the the rate at which uh people are being quarantined is different from last year and can you explain that difference please yeah so one of the things that we looked at in terms of quarantining was that the County is taking on that responsibility as they started to last year and then they shifted that to, to the district. The other piece is uh, with the variety of mitigation efforts that are being done or not being done, uh, we really went with the route of, of talking about the notifications and understanding where they're at. And uh, if there was direct physical contact where there was uh, prolonged contact, we are, uh, but we're not quarantining an entire classroom based on a a case within a classroom. So when we have the two classrooms that are currently in mm -hmm. virtual, 
I, I'm just looking at the dashboard and I'm seeing Cleveland, for example, where we had 19 kids, nine of whom had COVID-like symptoms. And it says 24% of the school is absent, but there are zero cases. I still don't understand that. Yeah, so at Cleveland, for an example, the, and this is where we talk about illness versus related COVID. At currently, when we moved that class to virtual only, 47% of the kids in that classroom were out ill. Not a single student had tested positive, but 47% of the kids were out ill. Some were seeking testing. Some had tested and were negative, but they were half the class, if you will, was out ill. Clearly, and, and we looked at as a team, other numbers of illness in the rest of the building. And it was really, for the most part, contained to that classroom. So clearly something was going on in that classroom which we felt a 10-day shift to virtual. A, 50% of the kids weren't up to learning at that time to the degree they normally are. Um, and we really didn't want to put the other kids in that illness. So we did a 10-day pause. They're back uh, this Friday. Um, but th so that's why no cases showed up. So it, it's it, the absenteeism, you know, we had an absentee for an example at Central High School. We had at one point 14% of the kids were absent. We had one case, but we had the stomach issue going around. It was kids with stomach flu symptoms that were absent. So it, we're in what you're seeing and, you're, and if you've been following some of the news, RSV, uh, the stomach flu, some of the other things, make this a very complicated process because you know, some are you know, displaying those types of symptoms and not specifically you know, or, or are testing it from some cases and not uh, coming po positive. So it just, um, it, it makes that much more challenging. That's why we're looking at both the absenteeism rate as well as the, the COVID positive. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, I um, want to say that I really appreciate this recommendation. I, I think it's very, very good. I can fully get behind it. Um, I, it answered my questions about, I wanted to start in a stop point. If we were gonna mask, what, what triggers it? Because I don't wanna be having these conversations every six months or something. And then when does it stop? So that everybody knows. Um, also for our, our kiddos with special needs who can't wear masks, um, with uh, special accommodations, IEPs, medical, whatever reasons. I'm glad to see that that's in here as well. That was another concern of mine. Um, I do wanna go on record saying that I can get behind this as I will not be at the October 12th meeting. I don't know if there's going to be any sort of um, action taken at that meeting or a recommendation, but um, this, this I can certainly get behind and I, don't want it to look like I just skipped town or something because I didn't want to vote on this. So um, let's let that be public knowledge. Um, so uh, the other thing I just wanted to say is to the gentleman who thinks we're talking about masks all the time and not worrying about the, our learning gap um, at the end of the last school year, just a reminder, we did our administration put together an amazing um, gap uh, proposal for us, which started with our summer enrichment classes and into the school year. And so we are focused on education as well as the mask. We're just doing a lot right now. Thank you. That's all. The questions? Yeah, Mark. It's hard to hear yourself. Am I being heard? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just uh, looking for some clarification on the uh, why wh why are we increasing the quarantine length to 14 days? And I guess exactly who, who does, is that reference to only uh, COVID positive cases as far as quarantining people? Yeah, and Mark, a good question. Those are things we could do. We're doing a 10 day right now. The, there's with the ability to once, obviously we can have a, a broader access to testing the test out on day, to return on day seven, if you had a test on, a negative test on day six or seven, the 14 day quarantine period is still what's 
recommended by the, the health department and, and others. So that's where I'm saying in that case, we could go back instead of doing a six or seven day in return or a 10 day in return, we could extend it to 14, which people will refer to as the standard. Um, that's I'm saying that that could be an option we could choose to implement if we felt that there was people returning and then displaying sickness after their return. If we saw that occurring, we could select that as one of those additional modifications, but we're not saying that that's universal being implemented at this time. It's just one of those additional things we could do. I guess to kind of follow up on that, I assume it's going to be the same type of answer for symptomatic students remaining at home for 10 days, but you're talking that the stomach flu is going around. Are we just, at this point, once they've 24 or 48 hours has passed, these kids are coming back to school from, if that's the symptom, because obviously there's a lot of cross, uh, Correct. <laughs> that these symptoms are under a whole, you know, not only COVID, but flu or cold and all this stuff. And I just hate to see some kid out with a cold, uh, you know, a sinus infection head cold for one day or two days and have to sit home for 10 days just because it's the same, it's a COVID symptom. Correct. So one of the things, Mark, that we had uh, talked about at the last meeting was right now, it, the, the plan that we put forward and discussed last week would, would, would be to change it to the, if you have those symptoms that would be falling under the COVID that you would need to be out for 10 days or have a negative test and return with your negative test. Right now, that would be a huge inconvenience for our families due to the fact that they're not readily available and not always free. We're trying to get those 19 testing sites up and running. At that time, we would communicate that we would shift to that if we, at, at that point in time. Uh, but right now, we're not operating that way because we don't have that availability for those that want to choose to return sooner than 10 days. I guess kind of following up on Mr. Berg's question, if we hit that mark and you implement the masks, the very next day it drops below the percentage acceptable and it goes for 13 days under that. And then day 14, it spikes again for some reason. We're doing another 14 days. Is that correct? That would be correct under that scenario, Mark, yes. Okay. And I guess I wanna have a better understanding of how we're gonna implement this at the with the different percentages at the middle schools, because there's a lot of, staff that are there for all of the kids are all are those staff like in the office and food service then going to be required because the sixth graders have to be masked the staff would fall under both yes and so we'd have sixth graders in the school masked but seventh and eighth graders not right It'd be optional At that point, it, it, Sue, if you turn your mic on a second, it's on? Okay. Um, at that point, it would be, again, it would remain optional for those kids if, if they didn't fall to that level. Vision, because you said next week that one testing would be open, that we would include that in that, because I, I agree with Mark as far as if there's a, a cohort, but um, my child doesn't have the symptom and I get test, I have them get tested, then they can go back to school the next day and they wouldn't have to wear a mask. Um, and also I think a provision for our staff, especially the ones that are vaccinated, that if they're vaccinated and they don't test positive, uh, that they would not have to wear a mask, that the mask would remain optional. Um, and I think that provision should also be included in that along with our students in the high schools that I heard a mother say that her daughter was vaccinated. And, um, you know, we give them that option, especially if they can show they have no positive um, findings, they've been vaccinated, that we still put that in there that they can attend school and remain optional with the mask. When you're talking about the testing to return to school, and you're saying you can test the next day, return to school, when you're exposed to the virus, it takes like five to seven days for you to get sick. 
so you could test the next day it's going to be negative and then like where would you be with that so if you're symptomatic if you're symptomatic and you have uh, on day six or seven you could test the return so it would be day yeah. six or seven so right. you would still be oh mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be like one person in the school tests or a classroom test positive i can get tested tomorrow and then we're good if to go you're not, if you're asymptomatic in that case if you were in there and you were concerned about the fact that there was COVID cases within your classroom and you wanted to 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 check you can also do that preventative testing through social are there going to be any guidelines i just i just foresee this being excessive amounts of testing Yep. And again, two factors with the guidelines. Yes, we would have clear direction on what that looks like. And, and two, it still remains as an optional choice for parents. Uh, yes. Um, first off, I want to thank the board uh, for asking the questions. A lot of those questions are were on my sheet. So I appreciate you guys for asking those questions and having it on your heart. Um, can the county information regarding 18 year olds to 24 can that be separated to show just the 18 year olds um i know it shows on page 10 it goes 18 to 24 for cases excuse me for the completion rate of um 45 percent um is it a way that the county can break that down to show 18 year olds versus 18 to 24 to give us a, a good number yeah, I asked that question of the county's new epidemiologist, Andrew, uh, a few weeks back, and he at that time was not able to, but I certainly could follow up with them again to see if I can get that number broken down. Okay. And one more question I had. Um, so to go back to the middle schoolers and the um, elementary schoolers for your the masking, um, when it gets to a certain percentage on page 27, do we have sixth grade classes in any of our elementaries? I know that some of the charters do. Yeah, so at sixth grade, uh, except at uh, LCA and SLA, the sixth grade um, is at the middle school, not at the elementary level. Thank you. Yeah, so again, we looked at that, that data from last year as one of the guiding pieces and also looked at the, that ability of um, the vaccination availability um, is where we centered on the 2% and 4%. Again, there's, no, there's nobody out there that's telling you, here's X percent to X. So we looked at the data from last year and vaccine availability. Yeah, so on that chart is what we looked at in terms of the number of times and occurrences that we had. Um, and that's when we that's when we noticed last year of when we felt there was concerns when we got at the elementary level. That's when we saw uh, additional illness and at the high school level, middle school level, that was that was there were more cases in those schools before we got to that degree. So talking about the vaccine, uh, vaccination access or availability and the two and the four, I'm looking at the numbers and they're saying that 36% of the middle school kids are vaccinated and 43% of the high school kids. So less than half in both cases have actually been vaccinated. Are we going to bring back the vaccine clinics to give those kids a better chance of having another uh, opportunity to be easily vaccinated if they so choose? Not during school, after school, at school, after school, we had vaccination clinics. So Are we at, going to do that again? At this point, we would be looking to, to partner again with one of the medical providers if it was going to be a uh, the announcement for the younger students. Uh, obviously, those who fall in that same range could take advantage of those as well. So they could go. To they could go to that as well. Okay, thank you. But again, we would have to work with a provider that would do that. Questions? 
questions, comments, whatever you want. Sure. I guess I'm just trying to get an idea if we're, you know, if we're going to discuss this further as far as our positions on it or wait for another meeting. But board wants to discuss this more or wait until if there's actually a proposal as far as because I mean I, I think the numbers the suggest I appreciate the work and I appreciate the difficulty in pinpointing what that bar is at the two and the four percent but I think that is extremely low uh, as pointed out before two out of 100 kids could each come from the same family and had nothing to do with getting that from school or at school or transmitting at school and now the school is impacted by these two kids that got it because they went on vacation. And so I guess one of the things that I looked at is the Sheboygan County Health Department in assessing uh, transmission, they don't assess it as being moderate until 10%. And so I kind of would, I think the bar should be closer to that in alliance, in align with what they say is uh, a transmission rate that we then need to kick in additional implementation of mitigation strategies. And I guess that's kind of where I would suggest people start to con contemplate if we're gonna do an implementation and taking something like that into consideration, you know, and just uh, kind of digest that a little bit and consider that. But I, I think the bar needs to be a little bit higher than two and 4%. And I do have a little bit of a concern about two different percentages at a middle school. I, I understand the vaccination thing, but I think that it's gonna, you know, I just don't know that it makes a lot of sense to implement two different mitigation strategies in the same building like that. It, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense that way. But I understand where you're coming from. Kyle, go ahead. Now, well, at the, at the last meeting, one of the things that came up, and I, I think it's a really valid point, is that there's a, a fairly good number of people on the board, and I think we can discuss that tonight, who feel that we kind of got off base when we as a board started dealing with this rather than having it be on the plate of the administration and the EMT. So, and there were comments made, including by you, Mark, that you were comfortable having the administration make those decisions moving forward. So can we, I mean, to me, if I, as I look forward to how we're going to eventually try to deal with this, I see two things. One is setting it very simply. We want Seth and the EMT to be making these decisions because they can pivot, they can move quickly. We are a very restricted body as far as how we can move, what we can do, putting out agendas, giving notice, having to have special meetings. None of that works well in in this kind of situation. And I think we're finding that out. Uh, so how did the rest of you feel about that? Would you be comfortable with doing it in like two parts, which is one, we let the administer, we, we agree that the administration should be making these moves. And then the other is we agree with the plan. We think it's, it's a good solid plan and we encourage them to move forward with it. Or do you not like that idea? I mean, what are you thinking? I think the bottom line is if we're trying to get the administration direction and the ability to make those moves, that, that's what this whole recommendation is about. And so it'd be nice to get, you know, consensus here of whether or not we agree with these set marks. Um, and I guess that was my input was, I think they're a little bit low. I mean, you look at the transmission rates and everything and it's amazing, you know, and. I understand the concerns and there's been some spikes, but at the same time, we've had school open for a month and it doesn't seem to have made some crazy spike that everybody was worried about, just like back at uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving of last year also, that those times didn't create an, a, a major additional spike. There might be more cases, but it's not this huge spike that everybody was anticipating. And so I think that we've got time to be able to formulate a plan that we can get consensus on so that they can have that ability to make those decisions on a moment's notice, as opposed to having board input on every, every everything, similar to what they've done to uh, transitioning this week with Jackson and Cleveland. I, I don't think anybody on this board has taken issue with the administration's ability to, to make those types of decisions. But I think it's best if we 
give them direction on what we agree with so that we're not calling them out on the table saying, what the heck are you doing here? You know, and I, and I think that we're getting very close to that point to be able to have that and, and move on. So one, I echo Marsha's comments that I believe this is reasoned, it's thought out, there's data behind it, and I support the administration's recommendation. There's a couple of things I just want to address. One, it, it, the data is in front of us. It's false to say that there's no increased activity. The seven day case average has doubled, right? Whether you consider that a spike or not, it's not flat. The next part as well is it's easy to pick numbers and say, well, two out of a hundred, there's actual data and mathematics behind it. Communicable diseases are measured by R naught values. And R naught value is the mathematical formula for the average number of persons someone who is infected with a disease can expect to infect. The low end, the common influenza or cold, has an R naught value of one to one and a half or two. So you can expect that if I have the influenza, on average, I will infect one to two people. COVID, when it started, had a three to four. Measles, the most infectious disease in human history measured, has a R naught value of 12 to 18. The Delta variant, which has hit us, and is spreading right now has an R naught value of six to nine, has six to nine. So if we take a low number there and assume that two positive out of a hundred, it's basic math, the low number, six to nine, right? They're gonna infect 12. That 12 then becomes just under, uh, I'm here, I'm doing math at the top of my head, 72, right? So now we have 72 in a spread there, just based on simple mathematics and geometric progression. This is math. This is not politics, it's numbers. We're in confined space. It's a communicable disease. The reason why we start when it's small is because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we don't prevent early on, that's where issue runs in. And I understand that there are folks in the audience who like to make snide comments, but we listen to you. It's our time to speak as a board. And if you'd like to speak, please go out into the hall while we have a discussion. We respected you. I would ask that you respect us. I thank you, Seth, and the team for what you've done. And I appreciate that you look back at the data because here's the thing. When you look at the numbers right in front of us, November, when it was the worst period in our county, 141 seven-day case average. Not once in that period, most of the time we were virtual, right? Not once, or not once, excuse me. On average, we only had four days where we crossed the 2% threshold for elementary schools, or five, excuse me. And we only had one day where we crossed the 5% threshold at the high school and four at the 4% mark. So the likelihood right now for folks in the room who are concerned about this mitigation measure being in place is honestly fairly low. That, that I, again, this is not your time to speak. You do not have the floor. You are not a member of this board. The public comment is over. To my fellow board members, we have a very reasoned, measured, data-driven plan, and I appreciate that. Thank you to the EMT. I yield. I wanted to uh, point out to, uh, I appreciate the daily attendance, and I, but I think some people look at that and when it gets to 10%, get a little bit bent out of shape. And I guess I'm gonna throw out there the you know the whole idea later on tonight we're going to hear about uh, some updates in the career readiness data and our criteria for that is 90 percent attendance for those high school graduates which that in itself that's our that's our bar that gets us at 10 percent absentee rate as being acceptable for career readiness so you look at some of the high schools and some of those absentee rates you got to take it with a grain of salt. It's not every kid that's sick or that has COVID. So don't rely too much on some of those numbers when they actually are a little bit higher, especially at the high school level. So I just want to keep that in mind too, when we're considering some of these data points that we're looking at. Uh, one clarification on that is the attendance data that you're seeing in that chart that's in your packet, that's just the attendance based on kids who are out ill. That doesn't count other forms of of attendance, uh, whether you know parent may have called them in for a funeral or a, a college visit or a workplace, or kids who just didn't show up to school. 
So that's just those who are coded as being ill or under quarantine. So is, I, I asked a question and I don't think we really got to an answer. Moving forward, what is our plan? Because I really think we need to at least have a plan moving forward or we're just stagnating here. Are we moving forward thinking that we are going to turn this over to the administration? Yes or no? How many of you are comfortable with that? I'm com so here was my thought, and, and I guess I want board reaction to this. My thought was that in two weeks at Committee of the Whole, that these recommendations would be posted for possible action, because then that would allow the board to vote on them, but it would also allow board members to tweak those numbers if they wanted to. So for example, <clears throat> if someone wanted to take the two and the four and increase them, you know, make a motion proposing that they be, well, whatever. You could change anything, right? Seth pointed out how they got to the numbers, but you know, there's there's no handbook, there's no guidebook for this. So if a board member wanted to make a motion at a future meeting, not tonight, that the percentages would be whatever, 10, the minimum would be a different number of calendar days, whatever. You could tweak any part of this. So I think now it's come down to this kind of bargaining amongst board members, right? Which has to happen in the open, which is where it belongs. It starts tonight, probably continues in two weeks, but then my, my hope is at that meeting, we close the door on this and we have a plan in place and we go back to the boardroom at Virginia Avenue to have our meetings and we do our, you know, we, we spend, we're starting to see that tonight and I've, this agenda tonight is loaded after this item with our regular stuff because we can't postpone those things anymore as we know we got to get back to business i i would think we would i would personally recommend that we go with with what the emt has come up with with this because in the same sense that some members of the board think that this number should be higher there are other people in the board who think that we are under tested in this community. And so when we look at our current numbers, those numbers don't really reflect how much potential COVID is, you know, what the situation really is because people are not necessarily testing their children. So I think we could go with the recommendation done by the, the people downtown who run the numbers and have looked at a lot of things because we're never gonna make everybody feel comfortable with any given number. And then we're back in the situation of back and forth and back and forth. I think they, I think they put a lot of thought in this. I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but I personally think, and I know that I'm pretty far on one side of this equation. I, I don't necessarily think that having the number be doubled for high school is necessarily appropriate when we have less than half of the kids vaccinated. I could say that. You know, so at a certain point, I think we need to just trust that they did the very best they could and move forward and see what happens. But that's my recommendation. Anyone else, comments, questions? If not, we're gonna move on. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, miscellaneous item B. This is the quarterly review of our long range plan. So this will be Seth, Jake, Mark, and Andrea. Uh, as we move forward, that's correct, David. And Andrea is online, so she'll be uh, speaking to us online this evening. Uh, just a, a couple of things before we begin the, the report of the district goals. Number one is just, to, you know, we've been, as David alluded to, out, out of the sink of some of our normal month-to-month -month activities. So in September, we come forward always to, to give you an update of where we're at. 
in December. We come for a, that uh, update in December, the same thing. March again, and then in June, we report out in the whole year. So we've got that um, September, December, March, June. Uh, just to, to note, this item is listed for possible action. As we get to goal two, objective four, you're gonna see um, uh, some changes that we're recommending around the administrative services building and the Warner uh, uh, Aspire slash sale program that uh, to bring those spaces in. So we're recommending a modification to the long range plan. Um, we historically don't do that during the year, but because that's a, a big uh, part of our operation right now, really feel that we want to make sure that those objectives are captured or activities, excuse me, are captured. So we will ask for approval of those as we go through and Mark is prepared to talk about that and give some updates where we're at. So I want to highlight that. Uh, before I turn over to Jake and he'll be the first one to, to, to talk tonight uh, and go through goal one, I really want to thank our EMT members um, um, and other administrators who work through and overseeing the goal work. And also want to thank um, Nicole and Sarah from the communications aspect. And I'll talk through their re uh, under goal uh, two of objective five. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Jake uh, for goal one, objective one and, and subsequent objectives. Good evening. I, um... I guess I want to start too by just thanking the entire SNI team for all the work that they've done so far in this plan and, and to support our schools um, coming back this year. It, it really has been fun to see all the kids in the classroom and uh, the focus on the, the learning. So the first um, objective, really two things I want to share out is one, we talked in our June planning about those uh, restorative practice training. So if you remember back then our um, principals went through training with, um, she was a former police officer from Detroit uh, in, in the restorative practices um, and that training continues. So really we have, right, just kind of our traditional rules and um, policies within our buildings, our PBIS and then restorative practices for kind of high-end behavior needs. So um, that works continues. And then the second piece is a addition from June and I think it was Mark that mentioned um, kind of the relationship that we have with DHHS. So um, really there's a, a three-prong approach there with Judge Tory also playing a role in that. So the three groups um, sat down to begin those discussions and, and really um, the focus there is to make sure that we are not duplicating services so that across those three entities, uh, there's kind of continuum of interventions that we use with students mainly around the area of um, truancy as we work kids through that process. So uh, that's the, the work to highlight related to objective one. Um, objective two, I'm just gonna hit on a, a couple of things here. Obviously there's, there's a lot there, but um, the online piece at Warner, we have about 120 kids um, online at the elementary level. And that, that kind of changes every day as, as more people opt for that. But um, that's about where those numbers are right now. Again, they're remaining coded at their home schools, uh, but being educated through Warner and, and Warner's access to the Wisconsin eSchool network. So um, that's been a pretty seamless transition and a nice job by the, the Warner staff and, and Jason Duff overseeing that program. Um, activity two is, is just kind of a neat thing we wanna share with you. Chromebooks, two, 300 bucks a pop, obviously not a very powerful machine, um, but, what we're able to do with these servers and, and with these licenses is essentially a kid can be in a CAD class sitting on a desktop computer with thousands of dollars worth of software and they can go home and access that computer through those servers. So kids have access to all that high part software on their Chromebook at home. Uh, we started out thinking we'd need a couple hundred licenses and it's being accessed like wildfire. So we're continuing to add server space and licenses to that. So that's been a great success for us. Um, Full plan co-serve is a, a, a training through CESA 7 that we do with, uh, it's all staff, but it's to, to really help our special ed students. Um, that can, that uh, training has happened at our middle schools and um, Kelly can tell you all about the, the EL standards and, and DPI changing those, but long story short, there's a lot of PD that's gonna happen with our EL staff to get where 
um, the state requires us to be for that 2023-2024 assessment and, and full implementation. So they're working hard on that. Um, and then the biggest thing that we continue to push is our dual college credit options at, at our high schools and really working with Lakeland, um, trying to get our teachers certified so that they can teach those CAP classes and kids taking those classes. Um, we look back at some reports. We're talking 380 enrollments in college classes at North High in 2019-20. Um, just a lot of kids getting a lot of college credits, HLC changing those standards, and we want to continue to, to help our teachers uh, get those credentials. It's 18 credits in a content area that they have to get. I think every single math teacher at North High did it or is doing it. It's a ton of work. Um, so we're really appreciative of our teachers that are doing that. Good for our staff, good for our students. Uh, um, really kind of a neat, neat thing for, for our district and something that sets us apart. Objective three is mental health. Jason Lederman is uh, probably the, the, the guru for the county and, and even getting to be at the state level um, where he works with all these different organizations to make sure we're doing what's, what's best for our kids. We just uh, spent some time out at the new Rogers building uh, last week, Friday, Thursday, Friday. Um, great facility. We're excited for them to, to come on board as well and um, Lakeshore Community Health continues to, to allow us to add therapists for our in-house mental health. Obviously, we have Rogers now if, if we need to layer on top of that. Um, and then we continue to look at kind of screeners and how we want to bring kids back in uh, after a mental health, cr health crisis exists. So um, lots of good work going on there. And then that final goal is, is probably the one that is most important to me overall, and that's our kind of continuous improvement plan for the accountability within our schools. And you're, you're gonna see um, in our next presentation, some early data, uh, you'll get to see the college and career readiness data for last year, which is always great to look at. Um, and the high schools will be coming uh, in front of you yet this year, working on the elementary and middle school report cards with Wayne to get all that information to pull from, from Skyward. Um, and we just continue to, to work through those processes. Any questions for SNI? Thank you. All right, then for uh, goal two, objective one, Mark will handle the first few and then turn over to Andrea and then I'll pick up at the end. Okay, thank you. So just a couple updates on uh, objective one of goal two around health benefits. Um, the benefits committee met uh, this month and uh, decided that starting in February of uh, this next February that we'll start to hold those informational sessions for our staff on a um, optional, what an optional um, high deductible health plan would look like uh, for people. So we're continuing with that. Uh, the Benefits Committee also agreed to um, survey staff if there's any interest on a, a voluntary group uh, legal service that uh, members could sign up for. And then uh, the third activity was the RFP process for our uh, in-health clinic that we share with the county and the city. Uh, an RFP was sent out. Um, we've uh, received the results of that. We've met with the county and the city. And just this last week, um, we had agreed to uh, stay with Intera Health uh, for one year uh, to remain with them for the next year. That'd be 2022 for the in-health clinics. Um, even with, uh, with staying with that clinic, there's um, still the contract was a, a savings for us from this uh, current contract. So we we're happy with that. Uh, objective two. Um, District um, has met with the county and the city to discuss uh, options and potential vendors to, to have a second uh, lateral connection to our fiber ring out to the WISCnet uh, network, which runs along uh, I-43. Again, that lateral is just for redundancy. So uh, right now, if, if the lateral that's uh, connected to our, our ring gets cut, 
uh, that would affect our, our service. So we're looking for a redundant uh, connection. So we're working with, with the city and county on working on how to move forward uh, to meet that goal. And then we've also been in uh, conversations with uh, Skyward uh, to talk about uh, the ability for that they would host um, our data um, through their services. And again, that's just uh, an effort to uh, lessen our risk of, of uh, being hacked, having data stolen or hacked into from the district. So uh, we'll continue to look at those options and start to get costing and, and make some uh, recommendations upon that. Objective three, uh, providing quality nutrition for students. So um, Meredith had applied for, and she did receive a waiver from DPI that would allow for uh, bagged uh, breakfast and lunches to be distributed uh, from a school or picked up from a school. Um, so we wanted to do that just in case there is a, a school closure or classroom closures where uh, parents would still like to continue to pick up the meal for their child. So again, that waiver uh, was accepted by the state and we're uh, prepared to do that if needed. Uh, one thing to mention is that uh, we are now seeing a lot of uh, supply issues around uh, food service. So uh, food items, uh, supply items are increasingly uh, becoming harder to get. Um, I know Meredith has made several runs to local grocery stores just to be able to complete uh, meals in a day. And again, this is uh, like the bus driver shortage. This is now a, a national a crisis too that uh, food service uh, departments around the country are seeing. So I just want to make you aware of that in case uh, you hear anything out in the community, you're aware that this is a problem and uh, it's, a, it's a supply chain problem that they're dealing with. Objective four. Um, so under objective four, I'll go through uh, the, the existing ones and then circle back to the change we would like to make. Um, Activity one around athletic field upgrades. Uh, the bleacher pads and bleachers have been installed at Field of Dreams. There's two new batting cages that have been installed out there. And then the other item that was done uh, was the North High football field uh, that was top dressed, overseeded. Um, they decreased some of the slopes that were found at the sidelines that led to some dr um, drainage areas there. Um, so that was a successful and um, so now that the football season is going and we'll take a look when that's over and just see how the field uh, you know, got through that and what type of condition and if there's more uh, overseeding or, or top dressing that needs to be done after the season. Uh, the good news then is that football season will now be in the fall. I remember last year it was in the spring and then had to get ready for fall. We'll have a whole year to prepare that field uh, this time around. Um, the committee for um, Farnsworth and Urban Middle Schools, the Citizens Advisory Committee met in August. They toured Urban Middle School, and then this month they met and uh, toured Farnsworth Middle School, and uh, they'll, they're continuing to meet uh, once a month. And then the uh, West Side Maintenance Shed, the new shed that's being built at Urban uh, Middle School, uh, the foundation is poor, the walls are starting to go up, the salt shed is uh, completed. Again, with some of the supply chain issues, it's going a little slower than, than what we normally would see, but they still do expect to be completed by the end of December. Um, the next step there is they're going to be pouring the uh, concrete floor in, in the shed. At uh, Horseman Middle School? Oh, did I say Urban. Urban. I didn't want to alarm the people at Urban. There's yeah. Not, I want to make sure nobody's there's no like, maintenance worse. shed building going up on their very limited space <laughs> at Urban. Um, and number four was uh, was that the long term facilities committee was going to make a re recommendation on the long term plan for the central administration building. As you all know, since that time, an opportunity had came up, and uh, the board had approved a, a purchase of the. Uh, former Wilson Mutual building uh, to, be, to become administrative services uh, building and then to do some remodeling in the current central building to allow the uh, sale special education program to move into there 
Uh, they currently lease space in Garten Apartments. And it would also allow Warner Middle and High School to move into that building. They currently lease uh, space on the riverfront. So we would be out of the, uh, the lease business for those schools. And I think that's been a long-term goal for both of those programs and schools. So with that happening, we're recommending that we uh, create activity, a new activity four and activity five. Uh, activity four is uh, moving to the new administrative services building. So uh, when we look at outcome measures, uh, the first one there is the new building purchase completed. Uh, that we have done. We closed on the property on August 18th. Uh, we're in the process of building modifications and preparations uh, to complete the office fixtures, configure them to the needs of the departments that are moving in there. That's currently happening now. And then uh, we're also uh, running a fiber optic connection to our ring. Uh, right now that there's a connection from the ring to Jackson School, that's the nearest uh, connection. And we've extended that to the um, new administrative services building. Uh, the conduit's been put in, the fiber has been pulled that we're just waiting now to uh, wait on some panels that have been ordered so that they can uh, make the connection. And then our IT department is working within the building to set up uh, networks and wireless access points so that um, internet con connectivity has to be in there before we can uh, start to move people. Our hope is that we can start moving people in November. Activity five would be uh, moving the Warner Middle and High School and the sale program into the new remodeled spaces in the central uh, services building. So right now we have met with Bray, they have met with uh, Warner uh, schools, they have met with um, our special ed department to go over their needs for those spaces. And Bray is currently working on draft plans that they will uh, come back with and share those and, and we'll continue to tweak those to a point where uh, we think they're ready uh, to be bid out. So were there any questions on the, the two new activities, especially, or any other questions? Okay. Then I'll Thank have you. Andrea just provide an update to uh, uh, where she's at with the uh, tracking and retaining staff. Thank you. I'm sorry that I'm not with you tonight, um, but I appreciate the ability to um, meet with you virtually. So um, our first goal, um, as far as conducting a teacher and administrator salary study, um, we um, just are in the beginning stages of that and will be, it's not a good idea to send out surveys at the beginning of the year to other districts. So um, we plan on sending that out in October um, for both of those employee groups. Um, we'll be working on our employee recognition um, rollout. Um, I'll be working with Nicole Sandali as far as um, we don't have our internal um, workplace that we were using. Um, so we'll look at other alternatives of ways that we can recognize each other um, within the workplace and give each other kudos um, internally. And um, the Education Career Pathways group will be meeting um, in October and continuing to work on, on filling our pipeline. We've done a great job as far as our special education teachers and using the right program um, and building our own uh, pipeline there. But certainly we'd like to increase our um, BIPOC uh, teachers and um, the rest of our staff. So we'll continue to work on that. And then uh, we'll be looking at leadership development opportunities um, for our staff um, as the year goes along. Andrea, I appreciate your updates. I know you've got a lot of activities coming up fast and furious now in this next quarter. Yes. Um, objective six then, it, uh, I'm providing the update for um, our uh, communications team, Nicole Sandali and Sarah Byron. Um, under activity one, the external brand, uh, you taught, heard me talk a little bit about uh, really increasing the amount of social media posts and gaining traction there. We have been hashtagging those 
uh, really around two different ways, the SASD difference and celebrate SASD, uh, really trying to highlight again all the, the celebration aspect of what we do as a district, but under the difference to really trying to specifically target and highlight areas where we are different from um, other districts or our, our competitors, if you will. So those are, are encouraged uh, continuing. Um, Andrea mentioned the new internal uh, communications platform. We had to discontinue uh, workplace that we were using due to cost. And so we're working through right now some additional options internally. Um, we will be uh, trying to bring something online in the next few months um, to really, again, focus on our internal staff um, as you go. So um, then the other thing I want to highlight is under bullet point three, uh, under the third bullet point, excuse me, under evidence is that we're gearing up to launch uh, the first um, monthly newsletter that will go to all of our families um, and specifically highlighting things that have occurred during the month of, in this case, September. So some welcome back messaging, um, highlighting a few key areas. Really what we learned from our brand strategy uh, research and report back was that parents knew a lot about what was happening at their individual students or child's school, but knew less about the overall district. And so we're really trying to work on how do we get pieces out there for all parents so they understand the, the breadth of what we do and understand if they're in elementary, what are some things potentially the child's gonna be exposed to at the middle school or high school if they're in middle school or just getting a sense of the district as a whole, as opposed to just their slice at the schools that their children attend. So we're excited about that. So we'll make sure that uh, you get an opportunity to look at that digital newsletter that's coming as well. So with that, um, happy to take any questions um, at all or feedback that you have. And then I would ask for a, for a motion to approve the, uh, the changes under that goal um, to objective four. Before we do that, any questions or, or comments about the report? Seeing none, uh, oh, go ahead, Mark, sorry. No, I was gonna say, I'll uh, move. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you all for keeping that moving forward and appreciate the report. Miscellaneous C is the 2021 academic and social emotional learning update. This would be Jake, Kelly, Eric, and Jim. Split mics here if we can. Um, we're kind of intermixed here, so this isn't the best format, uh, but we'll certainly make it work. Um, so really, the intention of tonight's survey is just to update you where we are on that um, kind of COVID gaps planning presentation that we did back in May of last year. Um, and what we didn't want to do is just wait until every piece of data was in to, to present this. Um, and kind of leave you in the lurch with, with knowing where we currently are. So this isn't perfect. We'll be back to, to update you again when um, we have more data in, but this is what we can share with you right now. And I think it's, it's beneficial for people to see. So um, as we look to slide two, just the agenda of implementation at the elementary, middle and high school, and then how we're using our COVID funds within, within SNI really. Um, planning goals, the biggest thing here, um, being that we continue to stress, we're bringing kids in from, from all different places, right? Whether they were uh, online for the whole year, some kindergartners who never did 4K, et cetera. So we can't teach down uh, to the students that weren't in that position, right? So our teachers are having a, a, probably a difficult time is, is fair to say, a challenging time to make sure that they're hitting the, the broad range of skills that kids are coming uh, in at based upon um, what their engagement has looked like over the last year. So um, that piece is there. And then the data piece, I, I always struggle. I, I hope you guys feel that we're transparent with you and that uh, we don't try to, to put lipstick on a pig or anything like that. So 
Uh, these are not excuses or anything like this, but this data is really hard to look at right now. Um, we're testing earlier in the year than we've ever tested before because we wanted that information right away for our teachers. Um, but as a result, you're not comparing ap apples to apples when you talk about fall testing because normally we'd have a couple more weeks of instruction before we test. Um, and anything when we're talking about national norms or state comparisons, uh, districts that were mostly virtual or all virtual last year are not getting included in that. And those are your large urban districts, right? So um, at the state level, Milwaukee's not accounted for in a lot of these at the national level. Uh, Los Angeles Unified School District is a big one, right? So you're, you're just running into a lot of different issues there, but um, we're gonna try to paint the best picture that we can for you. So if we skip down to uh, slide six, I'm gonna let Kelly talk a little bit about the elementary assessment. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, uh, circling back to the plan we presented in March um, to support our students as they return to the classroom this fall, um, we really do feel that sense of urgency. So as Jake said, we moved that window for all of our assessments in fall up a little bit so we could get as much information about our students as possible. So on slide six, you'll see that we have teachers using the many tools that we have available at elementary school. Fontes and Pinnell is one you've heard of before. It is essentially an assessment where we are sitting down one-on-one -on -one with students to learn about their reading um, proficiency and what skills we need to support in a small guided reading um, type of setting. Um, we'll have data on that after the window closes, October 8th. Um, we also have two uh, tools to look at social emotional learning. Um, Panorama is a tool that we used last school year, you might remember. Um, we have that available to our schools, grades three through five, as an option in fall, but required in spring. Um, for schools who wish to get more information about their students, recall that that's a student survey that they, the students themselves take, and then we take that information and look at that. New to us this fall is our best universal screener. Um, that's a new tool, like I said, to us. Classroom teachers are using that to identify internalizing and externalizing behaviors for all students, um, and then getting recommendations of supports for those students that um, essentially um, rise to the top for that need. Um, just, just recall that all of that kind of testing takes some time to do because it is individualized. So we do use our other tools such as STAR. So on page seven, um, as Jake said, we, as myself as the DAC for our district, the assessment coordinator, um, I keep hearing from all the different groups that I am a part of that we should use caution with this data um, because of that participation variation and because of that instructional uh, model variation. But this data is used in schools to identify students who qualify for basically another layer of support through our RTI tiered levels of support. So we tested um, with STAR the first two weeks of school earlier than we usually do. Um, and we're able to identify students quickly that would qualify for that type of um, intervention. Can you hear me all right? Okay, the second piece that's on there is the Lexia data. Um, if you remember in March, we came to with one of our plans for accelerating learning was to use a software program called Lexia. Um, we had some of our schools used it last year and this data is really only representing three of the comparison mm -hmm. schools who used it all year. But last year at the beginning of the year, 23% of our students took a placement test and were put into at or above grade level. Um, this year, those same three schools had about 17%. So another example of one, we started testing a little earlier. Last year, we started a little bit later with those placement tests as things got going. And two, um, some of our virtual students didn't use Lexia, and those students who chose to be all virtual last year are now in the classroom. So a little difference in data. Um, the big piece last year, I think that shows on there is by the end of the year, 57% of those students at those three schools we're in, we're at or above grade level material that they were working with. Um, 
so that'll be something we'll really analyze and look at this year is how students progress um, throughout the year. On, on slide eight, I'll give you a little bit more background on Lexia and some of the um, implementations that we're doing at elementary. Really our goals kind of go back to what Jake said, are we wanna be able to have students have access to grade level material, get individualized support, and then finally have some small group targeted instruction. So those implementations reflect that. Lexia, um, we purchased a four-year license. So we have a district-wide license to be able to support um, student work in Lexia. Elementary uses a program called Core 5, where they work on five core literacy skills. Um, and that really is a blended model where it's involved with 15 to 20 minutes of individualized student work on the computer that adapts to how the students are performing and then flags a lesson where the students may need more one-on-one um, -on -one support from that teacher. Or it also shows like a, a, a wider lesson that the teacher could do in a small group or the whole group if they need it to really solidify that skill and reinforce the skill. Uh, the, the nice piece with Lexia is they have district and building support for each of our buildings. So um, we will meet on a regular basis. I think uh, we started off in August in September, all of our buildings had an implementation support with representatives from Lexia to get started, to look at some fidelity measures. And then we'll be meeting again, October, November, where they'll start looking at some of the usage data and some of the, the units that students are gaining. Um, Kelly mentioned a lot about Fontes Pinel. Um, we'll be using that data to target those guided reading groups to know where students' instructional reading levels are at, but then also um, really looking at what are some of the levels we can support with we call them reading mini lessons, which would be that grade level access for students. And then finally, we purchased also, we, in March, one of the things we came to was looking for some leveled reading materials for our schools, for their book rooms. So if students, as Jake mentioned, might be reading at, at an instructional level at various levels, teachers can pull a, a group of students and have six books with a, a structured lesson that they can sit down and really target some of the students' um, skills to help them move forward in their reading levels. So really those are some of the big things we we're trying to implement to, to target some of the, the gaps we may see in reading. Eric's gonna take math. All right, thank you. I'm really excited to share a couple things that we've got going forward with math this year uh, and really resources and opportunities we have available for both our, our students and our teachers. So uh, it was prior to last year, we went through the adoption process and decided to move forward with Bridges uh, math curriculum uh, 4K through five. Uh, last year, we decided that might not be the best year to introduce a new math curriculum district wide and kind of put it on hold for a year with the exception of some volunteer classrooms. So we had 10 schools within our district that had a grade level within their school kind of pilot bridges going forward. Uh, and that was, a blessing in disguise for us really because it put us in a, a much better spot uh, to support our teachers and, and really have a successful implementation this year. I want to share a few things about it and then a, a success story with you. So I think the, the part that really to me is most exciting is it's truly a, a comprehensive curriculum that really um, I, I think is accessible to, to all students and really offers supports within the curriculum rather than having to pull resources from different places to meet the, the variety of needs we have within our classroom. So there's really three components within Bridges. I'll give you a real quick 10 second snapshot. Um, the first one's number corners, which really has taken our, our calendar time in the morning and turned it into a math routine uh, with some preview and review. Uh, so again, a nice opportunity to one, kind of catch students up on some things they may have missed, but also kind of give them some support for future learnings. Uh, the problems and investigations are really the core on level grade uh, instruction um, to ensure all of our students are having access to on level uh, curriculum. And I really think the, the engagement within that part has been phenomenal, just seeing kids in the classroom, um, the discussions that are going on, and really just their interactiveness with math from visual models to so some of the games I'll talk about in a second, uh, and not just so repeat of, of what maybe traditional math may have looked like. And then the last component of it uh, is the workplace environment. So after our, our problems and investigation, there's a workplace component that really takes a number of games. So really students would have access to six different games to participate in that related to that core instruction. And this is a great opportunity for our teachers to have time to differentiate. So um, within those six games, teachers can have 
uh, various skills that they're working on, particularly some might be related to a skill that a student needs to get caught up on. Others may be specifically for a skill that someone needs to accelerate within. Um, but again, we're able to do that within the course of, of our curriculum and our, our, our instruction, rather than having to pull uh, in a lot of different directions and pull outside resources in. Uh, the, the one piece I really wanted to share that probably excites me the most about where we're going from an elementary math curriculum, I, I referenced at the beginning that we had 10 schools that had a pilot grade level last year that piloted bridges. Um, when we went through our star growth data last year, um, of those 10 schools, when I looked for the highest grade level uh, of growth, seven of those 10s was the grade level strand that piloted bridges last year. So that makes me excited about the opportunity to have that access to all of our students uh, going forward, and I'm, I'm excited where our, where our math is headed in that direction. I think the one last piece I had in there, you may remember over the last few years, we've been going through a process of training our staff in AVMR, uh, Advantage Math Recovery. Uh, currently, our K-1 teachers are trained, um, and we'll be continuing to move forward with that going forward. Um, but really, that component is, a, is another piece where teachers can work more individually with students. Uh, they can include that within that workplace setting. And really, it's a, it's a way of training our teachers to really get a better grasp on where students are at. So a quick example on that is if we're trying to help a student um, say three plus four, right? Some students might go one, two, three, and then keep going four, five, six, seven. Some might start at three and then go four, five, six, seven. Some might know three plus four is seven. And our ability as, as teachers to more correctly identify where students are in their learning helps us determine next steps in terms of our instructional needs. Um, and again, I think that's a tool that will continue to be used going forward. So just um, looking at um, basically slide 10 here, a summary of what we have seen. We have been out visiting our schools, talking with teachers, talking with principals. Um, what we see right now, as you can imagine, um, bringing students, especially our lower grades, kindergarten, first grade students, um, back into the building. We are working really hard with building a sense of routine um, and building up stamina for those students who um, have not had that same opportunity. Just a reminder, um, last school year, we had 30% of our elementary age learners um, choosing a virtual option. I believe uh, current number is about 120 of our total elementary population. So many students returning back to the building, some for the first time. Um, and also recall that our kindergartners may not have had a 4K experience as some families chose to keep their students home. Um, what I sense when I'm in those buildings is an overall excitement just to be back in school by our students, by our families, by our teachers. Um, of course, our teachers are adapting um, very well, but adapting nonetheless to a transition back to a normal sized classroom. And of course, our specialist teachers are very happy to return to their role as a music teacher, art teacher, or FIAT teacher. Okay, we are going to. Right on, on slide 12, similar to elementary, uh, our social emotional learning data from Panorama, um, our, our sixth through eighth graders will take that assessment or have taken it by September 24th. That data isn't posted live yet by Panorama, so they're still working through that, but we'll be looking at that when that comes through. It was, it was optional, but our middle schools chose to do it. Um, on slide 13, Kelly, are you gonna do the star? Sure, absolutely. Um, so again, looking at slide 13, um, looking at that data, we do see some concerning trends. Um, interestingly, however, um, this is representative across our nation. Uh, Renaissance is seeing this um, throughout the data that our sixth graders are a bit further behind than those earlier grades and our seventh and eighth graders are the furthest behind um, pre pandemic expectations. So again, um, we're going to dig into why that might be. But in the meantime, we're using this data to intervene with the students that um, that are in that uh, 25th percentile or below. And let me just jump in real quick on the um, on that reading and, and star mass. So 40th percentile didn't necessarily change, right? So that 40th percentile is the same it was um, pre-COVID. The, the math scared me um, when I first saw it. We 
the <laughs> the forward exam is embargoed. We can't give you those scores yet. We're not seeing a triangulation of data there. We're, we're certainly, everyone saw drops, um, but we didn't see our drops being as out of whack with, with math and, and reading. So um, it's just gonna take a little time, I think, for these assessments to, to get honed in. You're not Mike, Kyle, I can't hear you. Am I on, guys? Thank you. Um, across cohort data, we're seeing not just in the Sheboygan Area School District, you're saying that that eighth grade group and that sixth grade group are lower generationally right now. Yeah, okay. exactly, across the board, Kyle. Did, yeah, across did, the nation. Right, yeah, did we notice that in years prior in the, in the data assessment on this group or did it seem to be as a result or around this period of time? I'm just curious. I mean, obviously correlation is not causation and there's a lot to be sliced here. I'm just curious if this was considered a low group when they were first or second graders. Yeah, the, I mean, you can, right? It's not apples to apples from grade level, right? right. So um, that's a piece of it. It's, it's not the answer to it. Um, so we didn't, we didn't want to kill you with data, but it's a, it's a really good question. That, that group was a little lower okay. uh, than the, the, pre or the, the groups that um, preceded them, but that, that piece is where it is. I, I think the hard, the really hard piece that we're having here is we're, we're seeing drops at the state level. We're trying to determine if we're dropping more than what's happened at the state level. And the state comes back and says, well, our data really doesn't include all kids, right? Because so many didn't test. So we're going to talk about forward data, but 30%, 20% of our kids didn't even test. Right. Uh, the star data, we had kids doing it at home, which we knew posed validity and reliability issues but it was data that our teachers needed at that moment to help kids. So we weren't worried about what it was gonna look like a year from now and we were giving a report to you guys. Um, so that's that piece of it. If the math scores are low a year from now, then we're talking issues and a major intervention that's gonna to have to take place. Okay. Um, so we're gonna get a feel for that this year. That makes sense, thank you. On the bottom of slide 13 is the Lexia data. No, the, the Lexia data looks a little different because the middle school version is called Power Up instead of Core 5 and Power Up focuses on word study, grammar, and comprehension, as you can see. Um, but last year, we're, we're pretty similar to where we were last year at the start when students took placement exams. Um, the, I think the value here is that our teachers can really target certain skills that students are having and we can really drill down. So you can see uh, word study, grammar, and comprehension are all pretty much similar to where we were last year. So we can really start to use that more individually now with students. Um, and that, that kind of leads us into slide 14, the, the implementation that at middle school brought to you in March, one of their big areas of focus was altering that schedule to really find that targeted time. So all three, all three schools have altered their schedule and built in an intervention time in the middle of the day um, where anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes, students can have uh, focus time for Lexia or for the math program, Alex, where they can have specific opportunities to be individualized. So again, it's a similar program in that Lexia is, in that it's uh, 15 to 20 minutes about per day, depending on where students are at and the gaps that they need to find, but then lessons flag and teachers can help in those small groups deliver those lessons or teams can look and see, we have this, uh, a gap or, or a need to solidify some things around informational reading. So we can really pull that in in our science, our social studies, our ELA classes. I'd also. Did the schedule changes um, last year at the middle school, right? So that wind time used to be 30 minutes and essentially the kids would get the intervention in the subject area where they were lowest, right? So if, and reading kind of took precedence. This year they have the 60 minutes to two 30 minute blocks. So kids can get reading and math every single day. So uh, that opportunity is, is there for them as well, which I think is nice coming off of uh, the COVID issues. And then that, that other piece is the Alex that's on there is that that's the math program where um, there's specific areas where students work on um, the, their math components that are personalized at their level and then they, they move forward from there. That win time also provides time for our EL and special education teachers to 
work with their students in a, in a smaller group setting, one-to-one. -one. So again, another op opportunity there. Um, and then there was professional development around both of those programs. Some of our ELA teachers really focused on uh, ELA and math, focused on Lexia for ELA and math for Alex. So now we have our science teachers also doing Alex, our social studies teachers also doing Lexia. So we expanded some of that uh, professional development. And then as you saw in the board goals, um, our schools are also focusing on that CESA 7 professional development with co-plan and co-serve so that we have maybe an EL teacher or a special education teacher teaming with a classroom teacher to, do, to plan and serve their students in their classroom at the same level. Um, on the next slide, slide 15, just really kind of a summary of, of the story of middle school first month of how we started. Um, we, I think a lot of students and teachers have noticed that some of the unstructured and transition times are different because we didn't have that last year. If students were cohorted, we maybe didn't have those transition times. Um, they re the really the beginning of the year, again, just like at an elementary level, we emphasize some of those daily routines. Um, I was at Farnsworth on the first day of school and was helping some sixth graders as it normally is on day one of school, how to open their lockers and find their lockers. But then I went up to third floor and talk, saw seventh grade students also being helped because they weren't they didn't have lockers last year. So again, that's that transition time of, uh, you know, really kind of coming back to it's always a transition to go to middle school, but for seventh graders, many of them, it was a transition as well. Um, but also the, the schools have gone back to focusing on building that climate and culture. So trying to bring back some spirit days, some incentive pieces, really trying to build that community piece, which, which maybe wasn't there when with, we were in different settings. Um, and then again, really focusing on those individual learning gaps. So our teachers in the classroom have some data where they know, and especially Neely in math, where students need extra support. We can provide that in the intervention time in the middle of the day, but we can also still get that grade level um, access to grade level curriculum. All right, Eric's gonna go on with the high school. All right, so on slide 17, uh, it's a bit repetitive from what Jim and Kelly have said, but our, our high schools, uh, last I looked, it was North, South and Warner have all completed the panorama, panorama survey already. Um, so that data will be to us uh, sooner rather than later, and we'll share it with you when we have it. Uh, if you flip to page 18, uh, I'm really going to focus on our college and career readiness uh, indicators. Uh, as we've shared many times with you, um, at the, the high school level, we really focus on uh, that uh, broad educational experience from academic programming to uh, personalized and career specific experiences. And I think our college and career readiness indicators are a good marker on, on how we're doing on these pieces. Uh, we shared the data with you in the spring, um, but really a, a lot of the data for a senior class uh, is completed uh, by the end of their senior year with, with some classes they may be finishing up, et cetera. So really we just wanted to update you on the data on where things are at and, and where we ended up. So uh, on page 18, we're looking at career readiness data. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the, the definition that we're using in terms of being career ready is meeting at least two of these indicators. Again, I'm not going to read through every single piece with you, um, but the attendance piece uh, seems to be right on track for where things have been. A uh, community service is something we're, we're finally moving forward with this year. Um, the tracking piece of that has, has been the challenge. Uh, workplace learning, uh, our senior class last year in 2021 um, had, ex had opportunities for that. I think, um, to be honest, I think part of um, last year offered some more opportunities than maybe have been in the past for kids to have some of those workplace experiences. Um, the actual industry credentials uh, dropped uh, just because of those connections with the schools uh, weren't, weren't as clean. Um, our pathway courses and our extracurriculars, our, our numbers stayed pretty consistent there. The one thing I will point out is this is a, a measurement of four years. So, right, so if you're looking at extracurricular participation overall, and you see the 2021 classes higher than 2020 and 2019, that doesn't necessarily mean we had an increase last year in co-curricular participation, but over the course of those four years, uh, our students are, are getting involved. And to be honest with you, I think as we talk about a, a final summary at the end, are excited to uh, re-engage in, in many of those opportunities again. Uh, the next two pages you'll find are, are kind of the exact same thing when we start looking at college readiness indicators. Uh, there's really one main difference between the two slides, 
and that is uh, the, the population that we're pulling data from. So on page 19, uh, what we're looking at for college readiness indicators are students that indicated they were on a, a two or four year uh, path uh, post high school. Uh, you'll notice in pretty much every single category, we have a significant dip in the year 2020. Uh, the, re the reason for that is our, our data for that year is uh, incomplete from the standpoint of we're relying on students to indicate their path post high school. Uh, much of that indication happens in the spring of the year. And when things got shut down in the spring of, of that year, uh, the vast majority of our attention was pertaining to how do we help students successfully navigate that environment that we're in. So we had over, I think it was over 350 students that didn't indicate whether or not they were uh, choosing career, whether they were choosing service, whether they were choosing a two or four year. So our, our, our data set isn't the same for that year. So I'll kind of refer to that on the next slide. Um, so I would really, I guess on page 19, encourage you to compare 2021 uh, to 2019 as much as possible. Um, Again, as you can see there, I think the, the numbers are, are fairly consistent. Again, these are, are indicators of, of four years of high school and that whole high school experience. Kyle, question? Indicators that, um, like based on past kind of clearinghouse data, we probably had more kids going to four-year school than were probably, you know, was the right path for them. And it was kind of showing out as well in terms of the retention and how many were actually completing that. Um, and it was pretty interesting based on the numbers. It was almost spot on in terms of a predictor. Are we still seeing similar trends of numbers of students that are choosing that path or is this perhaps helping them see different options that might better suit them in transitory learning or getting to a, immediately into the workforce in a different career path that might, you know, better suit kind of where they're, where they're at. I know that that was a large conversation, right? Was for a long time, everything was only four year. That's the only acceptable option, but we've got a lot of different opportunities for kids. And hopefully this counseling process opens up that opportunities for them and helps them make that decision. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think we've seen a drastic change in the number of kids stating that they wanna to go to a two or four year college. I think what's really shifted is the conversation that we have with those kids, right? So they put down, that's what they want. The conversation with them is, look, this is what the data tells us you need to be able to do to be successful in college. These are the areas that you're lacking. What can we do to support you and help you in that area? We really encourage our counselors to have that conversation and not a conversation of, well, you know, college might not be for you. Um, yeah. So that's the the piece there. I think kids are, are looking at things um, a little differently, but I, again, I think the really hard part with the data that you're talking about is going to be the kids that decided, yeah, I'm not gonna pay for college tuition to learn from home virtually last year. So, right, then the college enrollment numbers go down. And we, I, I know of, of a number of kids personally that did that, right? Or kids that, yeah, I'm gonna go to LTC and take my gen eds or UW Sheboygan uh, and take my gen eds and then transfer. So. The data is going to be a little wonky there, um, but the good news is here is, is our data across all these metrics is, is pretty much up. So we're feeling pretty good about that. Up and kind of compare slides 19 and 20. So the, the difference on 19 and 20, I'm not intending to lead off the ACT piece because we'll come back to it here. Um, so page 20 includes all students. So now when we're comparing 2019, 2020, 2021, you have a, a comparison data set to look at. I think when you come back to you know some of the college level pieces there, when you compare uh, pages 19 and 20, obviously some of the dual credit or advanced algebra courses and ACT scores um, are a little bit lower when we're comparing all students. Um, but again, I think that that's kind of fits what we what we've talking about is is a student that's not going um, to that college path. Some of those things aren't as important as a as a work experience might be for them. So I think, again, trying to really try to compare what's important to students and to help them be successful on the path that they're on. But I think the overall summary of those three pages is really that uh, our 2021 class um, was, was right on par with, with what we had seen in, in previous years.
so then the last piece, I guess, just in terms of a, a qualitative summary, again, I think you heard a couple of parents share this with you tonight, but I think just from, from my experiences being in a high school um, over the last few weeks, just the, the amount of, of kids being excited to be able to be back and interacting with each other um, has, has been exciting. Uh, I think one of the funny things is just that unstructured time, uh, the first couple of days of, of getting back to, to lunch um, prior to Prior to last year, we had open campuses and kids moving back to that setting weren't really exactly sure what to, what to do in that setting those first couple of days. Um, I think the, the whole idea of co-curriculars and building culture, uh, you heard homecoming being referenced. Um, there was a North-South volleyball game this week that both of our athletic directors said it was probably the best atmosphere they've seen at a sporting event in a long, long time. Um, so those kind of things I think are exciting for our students, exciting for our schools and really that return to normalcy. Um, on the academic side of things, uh, I think the, the one piece that our, our high schools, both of them are, are really working hard on, I shouldn't say both, all of them are working hard on, is, is really to make sure that any of our students that did fall behind from a credit standpoint have opportunities to get caught up um, sooner rather than later so that we put them on a path to graduate with their class. Um, as we, we progress on here, we're talking virtual instruction and very briefly here, as we said, about 120 um, kids participating in uh, the online elementary and then uh, Warner's numbers up 10, 15, 20% depending um, on the day, but they're, they're relatively small numbers. I think 75 at the middle school, about 130 at the high school. Um, and our third Friday report will, will be out soon and that'll give you a little bit um, more information there. I think, you know, we're in the same predicament that, that we have been. Um, we've seen some families last year that, that wanted out because we were taking uh, maybe too many precautions. And this year we've seen some families dip out because uh, they didn't feel the precautions were enough. But overall, I think our enrollment is, is pretty stable and will be around um, 9,600. Last piece is the budget implement. Uh, implications and we uh, shared this with you last year as well. So we have our Lexi subscription. Uh, we retain current staffing levels to help with class sizes as kids transition back. Um, KidStop has uh, been a challenge to staff, uh, but it's a great opportunity and, and you can see a ton of interest from our families and a, a, you know obviously a, a way for our elementary students to gain additional educational opportunities after school. Tutoring program is being set up at the middle school and really they're, they struggle, I think, to get kids to stay after school. So they're trying to also incorporate it into lunch and, and times when kids are at school to um, help with any remediation there. Kelly and I continue to work with um, different companies as far as possibly bringing in ACT workshops. Um, one thing we know, right, is you're gonna benefit from, from those workshops or from, uh, that study, but it's expensive. Um, so some families can afford it, some can't. We're trying to remove those barriers for our kids and, and have all kids get access to that with this COVID funding. Um, and then we had our smaller class sizes during summer school, which was a, a success as far as enrollment numbers go. Uh, Bridges looks good by all intended purposes. Eric and, and his team made a great uh, purchase there when they went through that adoption process and um, that's supported with these funds. And then our guided reading materials really focused on hitting our kids at their at their readiness levels um, have been a nice addition to our elementary schools as well. When would um, when would we get our next report out on this? Give a timeline in mind. Um, end of October would make the most sense. So basically in a month. Yep, just waiting for um, right. some extra data to come in and right. state hasn't said when they're going to take the embargo off the forward data. So okay. that's, that's always a piece as well. Okay. All right, thank you. This is great, good information to have and look forward to, you know, I, I could see this being kind of a regular regular agenda and moving forward so we can kind of keep tabs on it and 
to the yeah. degree that you think you've got new information to report out. Right, and so I, I think one of the things we really want to get back to, and and Jake and his team have done a great job putting it together and, and working, but as you recall, we've had presentations always throughout the year from our high school talking about career and college readiness, elementary schools talking about their goals and what they're focused in on. We'll have that additional um, district data and from the uh, those factors that you saw or those critical areas you saw tonight, um, as well as our internal report card data, some of the state stuff. So as they look as a, as a team to be able to bring that back, it really helps you stay on top of where we're at and it helps us be able to share uh, all the wonderful opportunities we have and also where those challenges and struggles are and areas that we need to continue to focus in on to ensure all our students are career and college ready. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll do D and E together since they're second readings. We got a motion for the adoption of D, which is second reading of new board of ed policy, 7544 use of social media and E, which is second reading of revised board of ed policy 9130 public requests, suggestions, or complaints. Any questions on the second reading? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Dates. Um, <laughs> you, you, can you help me? One meeting. So I, I Mar Marsha's always shepherded this process and I spoke to her and she is going to respectfully not shepherd the process anymore, which I am thankful. We're all thankful to her for um, all the work she's put into it, um, but she's going to let it go. So I, if, if someone wants to be kind of the new champion of the DAPES process, let me know, I guess, offline. Otherwise, I will keep my name next to it and I, I can take notes as it's part of their job description. Did, well, did, did we formally say that? Well, when I was vice president, that's how come I kept it. Okay. We'll talk. Okay, good. We'll, we'll talk. Anyway, <laughs> I think what we need to do tonight is we need to adopt the document that was in our packet, correct? Right. Line the four goals for the coming school year and then set in motion essentially the process that hopefully now we're all, you know, some of the new board members are still getting into it because you've only done this once, but the rest of us should be fairly familiar with. So really, Dave, if I can interject the two, the two things you really want to do tonight is one is the four goals that I have there for, for my personal goals that you would adopt or, or approve tonight or ask questions about. Um, and then two um, is to be ready to um, at the October meeting. Uh, to be ready to provide uh, feedback and you facilitate a, a conversation and closed regarding that formative uh, performance report. That so we would, would do that. So October. we would do that in a month. You do that in. Typically, we've done that the first meeting of the month as opposed to the second, but that's up for debate. We'll David, to see. Yeah. Where it fits best on the agenda. Okay. Four and five. Right. Last two those pages, last two. Mm -hmm. right? Those last two pages, um, those what are there? Six performance standards. That's correct. Yes. Yep. Board members, you would um, write down comments, specific evidence regarding those six performance standards, and then what we would do is we would discuss those as a group. Any questions regarding the four goals that were submitted? That were in our packet. Was um, the role of the district administrator in achieving the goal? Has that always been there, or was that a new feature? Sure, um, that yeah, was like added that. by Dave, just really to try to solidify. Is this really something I'm personally doing all the work for? Is this something where I have the direct responsibility? Is this something I help him to facilitate, or is that really, you know, am I the guide on the side, sort of? But you know, it ultimately all rests that. At the end of the day with myself but where where's my role within this goal because there's many things that occur across the district obviously that i need to help facilitate and need to help guide or i'm directly doing so that 
that was new. I like it. It I really like helps you understand a little bit more about yep. where my role is in that as opposed to what the role is in. Right. Say again. The expected term completion. Yes, right? correct. And I like that as well. Yep. Yes. A quick question, Seth. I mean, I appreciate and uh, support all of these, and I think it makes sense year over year continuity and most of your job is a long-term strategic role. Um, one just quick question on the develop and refine a uh, leadership succession plan. If I remember correctly, we did have a closed session where we talked through succession planning. Is there is there a change to that or is that an, a different indicator of success? Or I'm just, just curious if that um, is tied to what that was or is this addressing a different piece? Yeah, it's one of the reasons I want to keep this, and this would be a, a goal that I had uh, last year and we added it on as a result of uh, the board and really asking for more uh, clear levels of communication around succession planning. What does that mean? Uh, not only for the, the my role, but for other roles within the district. So I, I wanted to maintain putting, you know, having this on here as a way for us to continue to refine that um, as we see people seeking out other opportunities. What does that look like? How do we help develop? Uh, we're going to have some uh, potential retirements in the next couple of years. Are there internal people that we want to provide additional opportunities for? Um, or are we looking at this point in time that might be an external role? But how do we maintain this, this notion, especially around our, our leadership of our close to 70 administrators across the district? How do we ensure that we've got continuity and that we're providing people the opportunities to grow and develop? So I, I would envision that same thing, Kyle, in addition to the reporting out on specific opportunities for leadership growth, but for us to also have some conversations about succession planning. What does that look like? Thank you. That's all I have. Questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to doc adopt this document as presented. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. So again, um, board members, um, we'll get back to you on the timeline. Um, again, normally we would do that report out in two weeks, but we'll we'll see how that, where that can be the whole um, agenda lands and whether or not we want to do that night, night or do we, do we want to do it in a month? Okay, reports of committees, uh, cur curriculum and instruction, Kyle. Okay. Uh, item number one is for information, seclusion and restraint report. No crazy outliers here or any trends in the numbers. It's pretty standard year over year. Uh, for newer board members, that is our annual report out on times when a student is secluded or physically restrained. And a lot of times we're seeing that more with students that have certain disabilities involved or behavioral um, disorders, but um, pretty standard there. And number two is the graduation requirements. This is required by state statute. Um, these are not any different than pre-COVID. Uh, um, and actually we're kind of returning back to it. There were some adjustments as a result um, of what had impacted that, that March of 2020. So I would move approval of item two, graduation requirement. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Item B, Re Human Resources Committee, Mark. I would uh, move approval of uh, item number one, appointments, and item number two, leave of absence that were uh, listed in the committee minutes. Questions? Motion in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Ken's William started today at South, his first day as associate principal. We're happy to have William join our team. And uh, he was one of those uh, appointments under number one. We'll have him be introduced with the board at the October 12th meeting. We're shooting to have him come and be able to give an introduction of himself and so you can just meet William. Okay. Facilities, Recreation and Theater Committee, Ryan. 
approval of item number one, the fund balance request with five-year cap capital schedule. And what this is, is there's only one item um, that's being uh, requested as, as a capital expenditure um, using, using their fund balance this year. And what it is, it is a, a field liner, which John tells me it is fancy as all get out, but it will save time and paint. Um, apparently, so it's, it's, it's so whatever you were lining the fields at North Urban or at Field of Dreams or whatever, um, it, it saves a significant amount of time. Um, apparently, it's all GPS run and everything else, so it's got bells and whistles. But in the long run, it, it, it's, it's needed is it'll, it, because if anything, it'll save time for the workers who have to run it. Questions? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Anything else, Ryan? No, I'm good. Finance and Budget Committee, Marsha. Thank you. Um, items one, two, and three are um, we're in the audit right now, so it's uh, we don't have any information till the audit is completed. Item number four, we're going to address in item number nine. And um, I have three first readings that I'll read individually. I'd like to move approval of first reading a revised Board of Education Policy 7230, gifts, grants, and bequests. Questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. First reading of revised Board of Education Policy 7550, joint use of facilities, um, interlibrary loans. Questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Item number seven, I move approval of first reading of revised Board of Education Policy 8405, Environmental Health and Safety Program. Questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. And then I'd like to. Um, Move approval of gifts in excess of $2,500 by the Urban family in the amount of $4,000 for James Madison School and acuity for the Sheboygan and the amount of $10,000 for the Sheboygan Theater Company. Questions? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. And then I would like to um, move approval of item number nine, budget revisions and transfers of appropriations. Um, this was not cited correctly at our committee meeting. So we need to take action this evening on that line item. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay. And that's it. Thank you, Marshall. Mm -hmm. Kyle, anything for Committee of the Whole? Nope. Special board committees and assignments, uh, legislative. I don't know, Ryan, if you were there or Seth. Got it. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I was a little bit late to the meeting because I had to download, I think, my eighth different uh, streaming meeting, <laughs> meeting app. So I missed the first part of the meeting. Most of it was actually talked about, um, it was a, a discussion that was generated by, um, by Mr. Brugink over at um, over at Oostburg, you know, just and it was a, a talk, it was talking about how do we, you know, with everything that's been going on with you know with the public and being very, you know, very involved in COVID and CRT, you know, how, how can we reduce the temperature? Um, and like with many things that are you know, that, that's been going on in, in our society. The, we didn't come up with an answer. We're not going to anytime soon, but, but that was a, a significant part of the, of the discussion from when I was able to participate. And so we talked about uh, towards the beginning were just updates from districts around their, you know, what they're seeing, the welcoming mm -hmm. back of students, uh, opening of school, et cetera. A mm -hmm. um, couple of things to point out, the legislature uh, was meeting today number of bills that are being put forward uh, will be interesting to see where the Senate 
uh, that was in the assembly today. Senate was trying to vote on some as well. Um, many of those bills talk about, uh, you know, implementing mandates at the state level that will have a direct impact on us, whether that's curriculum transparency and posting of, of uh, resources, whether that's what we can and can't do around uh, the work of, of uh, race, equity, et cetera, uh, handwriting cursive bill, uh, fiscal transparency bill. Uh, there was, a, uh, and one I'm for the life, oh, reading assessment yeah. bill and civics education bill all around what are what schools should do or what schools shouldn't do, um, all applied um, to the uh, public schools and charters, but not applied to our voucher program schools. So that was a point that I brought up to our legislators as well is, you know, we've got more than $3 million of Sheboygan area school uh, boundary dollars, if you will, uh, going to private schools who are involved in the parent choice program. Um, and none of these bills impact them. Even the fiscal transparency bill does not impact them. And so I've got some concerns just all the taxpayer dollars. And we heard some people talk tonight about taxpayer dollars, and yet very little is ever talked about our voucher schools and the more than $3 million that are being used. And nobody knows a lot about it. Was there anything that they were actually proposing that they believe would actually be not vetoed by the governor, that there's actually changes being proposed that could actually be implemented? Because I mean, I, I don't anticipate any of that would, even if approved through the House and the Assembly, or yeah, through the Senate Assembly and through the Senate, that it's gonna be approved by the governor. So, I mean, it's gonna be just a- Yeah, I, I don't know of, at that point where, where it, it ended up, but that really goes back to Ryan's point when the question was asked, you know, tell us more information about the bills, where do they stand locally and how do they support them or not? And it was really a conversation around, well, this is what our fellow legislators are doing. If we support it, we probably signed on, but they have been receiving unanimous votes, um, usually along party lines, either side. So it, it was one of those discussions about how do we get to the real, the meat of it. And there were questions raised about local control, i.e. the school board, setting those parameters about different curriculums that we want to see, as opposed to the legislator saying, this is what you should do as a school board. So some of that at times does, does um, make for interesting conversations about who should control those, those decisions. Yeah, if I may jump in, Paul, another topic that was discussed was what happens after the COVID money runs out? As, as we are all aware, um, joint finance and that you know, was signed by the governor, um, didn't give us a raise. You know, did not, did not, um, you know, they basically said, well, you have this COVID money that you can use for, you know, for your per student expenses. Um, we're not going to do, we're not going to increase your, um, you know, your per student, your per capita um, expenditures, or your, your, either whether it's a limit or the the amount that you're able, or the amount that the state is giving through aid, um, and this and that was a concern that was brought up by pretty much every single district. You know, conservative areas, not so conservative areas. It's the what is your plan now that you've done this? You know, as you know, as the legislature, where where are you going with this? Yep. Good summary of the meeting, Ryan. Okay, anything else on legislative or questions? Okay. Uh, Citizens Facility Advisory Committee. Mark, you referenced it a little bit in the. So um, the minutes were included in your packet. We met last Monday at Farnsworth Middle School. So uh, Principal Todd De Bruin and a uh, representative from Bray and uh, Joe Volmer and Dave Albright from facilities led the group on a tour of the building. We just looked at some of the uh, challenges with the size of the rooms there and those facilities that related to um, classrooms. And then uh, Joe uh, and Dave focused on some of the more of the infrastructure uh, difficulties they have in that aging building. And then we discussed, uh, we went outside and kind of showed what parts of that building in the um, suggested draft by Bray would stay so that newer 
newer section that includes the gym would remain and then uh, a new school would be built uh, to the south of the gym. And then when that was completed, they would uh, take down the, the old part that is basically all the classroom space uh, north of the gym. So, so the group had a nice tour. They kind of understood the plan that, that Bray brought forward. Um, and again, we'll just continue to meet. Uh, we're still deciding on the location of our next meeting, so. Thank you, Mark. Questions for Mark? Okay, and then finally, Wigan Public Education Foundation. Um, I wasn't able to be there. Yeah, the, there. I arrived this uh, extremely late myself, so uh, the minutes are there for your um, reading enjoyment. And just remember, All In For Education is the first yeah, Friday in at the Pine Hills new location. And if you want to buy raffle tickets, um, buy them from myself first, though. <laughs> maybe the grand raffle prize is an autographed jersey by Giannis from the box. Yep. which I think could be a pretty cool, I don't know, your bucks person. That would be a it's nice, a that's the grand point. prize. That's the grand prize. There's a bunch of other, bunch of other prizes. Communications uh, are listed that we have been receiving lately. Future meeting dates, uh, committees on the 12th and uh, regular board on the 26th at our regular times. Um, we'll see where we land in terms of location for the committees on the 12th. It'll be in one of the buildings to accommodate a bigger group. It, we'll just have to see where we do it. So just be on the lookout for a um, different location than the than downtown. Yeah. Just a shout out to our electronics guys yeah. to really work and to get everything yeah. set up. And yeah. thank yeah. you guys. Yes. Um, it, it takes a lot. And hopefully, you know, based on feedback, and, and we don't do this enough to get it in rhythm, but you can tell it I was much was better tonight in terms of sound here yeah, and perfect. process. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I need a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Post, we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.